and I think we're live. I hope so. Uh, I hope so too. We're uh, we're doing something kind of new today uh, due to the fact that our producer, Randon, the producer, has to actually be at work. He is currently doing this remotely, and uh, hopefully everything is working out. Uh, I should probably open up the YouTube comments and see if I can see anything at all. Oh, we are alive. I just heard myself talking. I'll actually leave that open. For it was glorious. You sounded fantastic. Ah, uh, yeah. Anyway, a couple of things I wanted to talk about before we get started. Uh, number one, we are sponsored by joinplayboy.com. Click the link, support Zero Cool Podcast, and subscribe. Uh, there's a custom gallery that's put up every week for you to check out. Uh, as I've said in the past, I've checked out the website. Uh, I have a lifetime subscription I was given by them, so it's pretty It's pretty great. Um what else do we got? Oh, starting this week, we are launching the Patreon account. Uh, this will be directly uh, to monetize this podcast. Um, I think the first tier is 10 bucks, and it's basically just you um, paying the fee, so on and so forth, every month. And uh, we're going to be doing some after podcast uh, commentary, so on and so forth, some stuff that you'll be able to see. Um, exclusively on Patreon so that you guys have the benefits of that. Also, there are tiers to it as well. Um, I'm also going to be de- releasing um, previously unreleased live sets from the last 15 years of me recording everything. Oh, those will be good. Oh. So let me get some like 13 year ago Parker smacked out of his mind 3 a.m. mixes going on there. <laughs> Fucking shoes in a dryer. <laughs> but yeah, we'll be we'll be releasing those. Uh, some of them aren't going to be labeled because I just don't remember where I recorded them. <laughs> but most of them will have dates. But Parker's dubstep mix 2009. That was 2012. But yeah. Oh, I, I was, hit a little uh, close to home on that one, huh? I was, uh, I was a little late to the dubstep scene. What no, else do I no, got going on? No, you on? weren't. <laughs> um, oh, also. If you were at Brothers last night for the UFC 261, I want to thank everyone that came out. Uh, Rupert Sport always has a great representation. Uh, both the Kevins were out there. Uh, Sadiq, uh, Skyler, uh, of course, Callie was with us. Uh, Sheldon, uh, Eric Lehman, who was in town. Um, Wait, he was in town last night? Yeah, well, I was just hanging out with him before this, too. Eric, you fucking shitbag. <laughs> oh, yeah. Also, shout out to Simple Leaf, his uh, CBD company. If you have yet to no, go check it out. don't go follow him. Don't check it out. <laughs> Boycott Simple Leaf CBD. <laughs> Rap bastard didn't tell me he was in town. He told me he was in town last week. He was, I mean, I don't know what exactly happened because he told me he was in town last week. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, he hit me up and he was like, what are you doing for the fights? And I was like, you're still in town? I don't know if he took off and came back or what the deal was. Rotten motherfucker. So it's like yeah. the herpes of fucking guests. Leaves, comes back, annoys you, goes away, <laughs> comes back, annoys you, goes away. <laughs> Fuck you, Eric Lehman. So uh so yeah, I ended up meeting up with him, uh Kingston, Jen. Uh, God damn, that's my that's literally my entire Twitch following. Everybody that ever <laughs> like the three people that watch me stream live, they were all in town. That's, yeah, we, that's uh, awesome. We went to uh the public market, we had some food. Um, everyone else was drinking. I'm, I'm still not drinking, man. I had a club soda. I drank Red Bulls last night. Wow, you're really taking a page out of the kid cut up playbook here. You know what? The problem is, is that like I'll have a beer occasionally, but I've said it a bunch of times on this podcast. Um, not DJing can sit like six, seven nights a week and doing ten shots a night, and yeah. having a couple of mixers. I'm a lightweight now. Yeah, we got old, dude. Yeah. It happened. Yeah, it happened in the middle of the pandemic. I yeah. got old. Like I have a beer and a half, and I started talking shit to Catley. I'm like, "Sup, girl? How you doing?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my Friday nights, I started doing again. You know, corner pub stees, and it's totally fun. But like, I run into regulars from Jackalope, and it's great. Like, it's obviously cool to see people you haven't seen in a year. But they've still been going out, and I haven't been so. After like the third shot of whiskey, I'm like, Dar, I can't hit play on the button there, hey. Like I'm just completely smoked. It's I'm, not a good look. I'm in the exact same boat. I uh like I how do I put this? When I was just in Florida, I'll use this as an example. And I'd been sitting at the pool all day catching some sun and sh- and stuff like that. And then I was like, Oh, I'm I'm gonna go out, grab some food. And maybe have a drink or two. And I had a margarita, and I was like, "I'm gonna need some more food." I was I was hammered after margar- <laughs> one margarita. Christ, like I went to go stand up to go to the bathroom, and I was like, "Oh shit!" I was like, "God damn it!" Like if only I could have been this much of a cheap date twenty years ago. No shit, dude. Um, but now it's it's just weird that like I try and be way more in control still. And then after I ate again, I was able to have like 
two more, but it's weird. I was talking about this with Eric. Like, I really need to pound like two glasses of water after every drink. Otherwise, that hangover is. Oh, it's a motherfucker. It and is. that started when you hit 30. Yeah. And that's a. Sl- well, my, my hangover, my bad hangovers didn't start unless like I got blackout drunk. Yeah. Uh, I mean, then I'd wake up the next day and be like, what happened? But yeah, there was a good six years in my 30s where I was talking about this not too long ago where I would go out. At 11 o'clock, I'd meet up with Ferraro and a bunch of people. Bar would close. The staff would invite us to stick around afterwards. Mm-hmm. We would continue to A-bar till 4 in the morning. Then I would get up at 9 in the morning. I would go to the gym. And there'd be times where I'd be like, I'm still drunk. Yep. And I'm boxing. And I'm doing jujitsu. Or like I'd be sweating booze. Like someone would be like, Parker, you smell like the Stanley Cup. And I'm like, I'm sorry, man. I'm like... Yeah, you, you can't was. hide it. Like, 23 was a long time ago. Yeah. Like, drink till 6 in the morning, up at 9, work a 12-hour shift, go out, drink again. I think of that now. I'm like, I need a fucking nap after I put my socks on. Like, exactly. it's ridiculous. So, it, it's, it's been rough um, as, far as, uh, as far as drinking and, and me post-pandemic mm-hmm. goes. Um, there's one other thing I needed to bring up, or a couple other things I wanted to bring up before we dive completely into the podcast. Um, UFC 262, I believe, is May 15th. Uh, I did not put it in my notes. Uh, once again, don't forget, we host the UFC fights uh, every month over at Brothers. That'll be the Oliveira Chandler card for the 155 title. The co-main on that is the Edwards Diaz card, which will probably be the... Uh, whoever wins that fight will probably be fighting uh, um, Kamaru Usman next. Also, uh, shout out to Laura Tarzinski. I hope I'm saying your last name correctly. Um, she had her MMA debut last night in Lexington, Kentucky. She won via triangle, I believe, in the first round. Uh, it's a good friend of mine, Lenny's girlfriend. So she's recently uh, made the move to MMA from boxing. Uh, also, one last shout out. If you have yet to check it out on Mixcloud, look up Jägermeister Behind the Shot Mix. Uh, they released my uh, mix I did for him for diversity last month. Um doing pretty well i dig it i actually played it for my dad on the way we were somewhere in georgia and he was like so what's he's like so what's this this thing i keep hearing and i i I played it for him and he was just like this is pretty cool like there's there's a mix of like gary wright versus kanye west and he's like i really like this oh the even the even cringier part is it's jesus walks versus uh oh gary white um and oh, I, that's 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 brutal. <laughs> I love the track, though. I, I seriously, I love it. But it's just one of those that because it, it flows really well together. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's it's just one of those that like if if that's not something you're expecting, it's just like oh, that's completely an early out of left field. <laughs> um, and I believe that was it for all the shit I had to get through. I'm Eric, sure you got. I'm sure you got one more. There's got to be one more in there. No, well, technically Chicago, Nick. Shadow personal training. If you're in uh if you're in Chicago, see there's go always check more. Out, go go check out Chicago Nick. Uh, we it. talk about him all the time on the podcast. He'll actually be here after the next UFC event. I might have him on in about three weeks. We'll be wrapping with him about personal fitness, uh, different workout routines for people that do jujitsu and kickboxing and MMA in general. The dude's a uh, a walking encyclopedia of shit you should be doing and things you should be eating. So check them out. Shadow Personal Training 2618 Halstead in Chicago. And go check them out. DJ E. Rich. Parker the fucking pitch, man. Jesus Christ. We got like, that was a solid like seven minute promo there. You know what? Here's the thing. Um, For Chicago Nick and a lot of these, it's like, well, actually for Chicago Nick, I don't get paid on that, but. Yeah, yeah. You, you probably shouldn't talk about who's paying you to do anything because then there's just, yeah. That doesn't matter. Uh, the five people that are listening. Hey, that's five people. One of them might be my mother. Oh, okay. Hey, uh, Mrs. Ri- hey, Rich. Hey, Mrs. Rich. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Mrs. 20 Ryan. years later, you still can't get my fucking name right, you idiot. We should we should <laughs> at some point explain to everyone how you got stuck with your DJ name. Dude, based on my literacy. Uh, yeah, MPS, making stupid people. <laughs> that's fucking Parker Zero Call. Actually, you didn't even go to MPS. You're fucking Franklin or Oak Creek product, right? I was in Oak Creek, but I started out in MPS. And Aha! Then- and then mom graduated from a uh, nursing school and she was like, I'm getting my son the fuck up out of here. I'm moving down south <laughs> to Dude, the OC. To the OC. Oh, Christ. You I was should just, be way more annoying than you are if you grew up in Oak Creek. I just, I was just talking about that with Eric today that I was telling him. I was like, yeah, it's like I was literally the kid in like 1992 that moved to Oak Creek. LA Raiders jacket. <laughs> Uh, Raiders hat, dude. Bo Jackson it, jersey. I'm surprised they didn't call the cops on you. Just like walking in from fucking seventh grade, just like nope, he's got to go. Mister Mather tried buying weed off of me. 
<laughs> Everyone's trying to get you to cut their fucking lawn. Like, <laughs> hey, kid. Like, dude, no. Like, stop. You racist <laughs> yeah. white fuck. Leave me alone. Yeah, I live in the burbs now. Like, Relax. yeah. Like, I'm one of you. <laughs> Except me. <laughs> but um, I think this is South Milwaukee. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, speaking of trash towns. Yeah. So yes, uh, the DJ E. Rich name, uh, for those who do not know, this is uh, Parker's claim to, this is my whole story of your claim to fame, by the way. Parker's not famous for anything other than this, obviously, is uh, we were at Bar Milwaukee 2002, I want to say. Yeah. 2001, 2002. And uh, our buddy Mike was the DJ and he got sick for the Harley 100th, which at the time was like the obviously the biggest party Milwaukee had had since probably 1982, mm-hmm. at least the Brewers was the last time there was probably anything that big. So there was a Third Street Block Party sponsored by Harley, and every DJ within you know a couple hundred miles was booked because every place had DJs that night. So there's probably 50,000 people on Third Street. And dude got sick, so I hung out there all the time, and they were like, well, you know music you have any interest in doing this? So I was like, yeah, how hard can it be? <laughs> yeah. So I ended up uh, going in, not having a clue in hell what to do and just kind of train wrecked. I mean, kind of what I've been doing for the last 20 years, but <laughs> just kind of train wrecked my way through it. And then at the end of the night, I got my $150 check and I thought I was the richest human being on the planet. <laughs> like dude wrote me a check for 150 bucks. I held that shit up. Like I didn't want to cash it. I mean, I had like $7 in my name, but I was like, they paid me $150 and gave me free alcohol. This is fucking next level. Like, I'm never going to do anything this cool again in my life. And then uh, I got done, went to the office so that they could uh, yeah, wrap the night up and whatever and say thanks and goodbye. And then they asked me to come back. You, know, you have any interest in doing another night? I was like, sure. And then I didn't have a DJ name because I wasn't really a DJ. So they still just wrote Eric, E-R-I-C-H, on the schedule. And then my illustrious friend Parker walks in. <laughs> Looks over. Now, keep in mind, I've known Parker for two years, probably at this point, two to three years. And uh, he walks in and he walks right up to the little thing, looks at it and looks at the Joey, I think was the manager at the time. Yeah. And he goes, uh, who the fuck is E-Rich? And then it was like that. It was just silent because I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And he's like, E-Rich. I'm like, that's Eric, you illiterate fuck. That's me. Like, <laughs> it's spelled with an H. And then that shit just stuck. <laughs> like no choice like I, it, which it doesn't matter i couldn't come up with a cooler nickname but like always cracks me the fuck up because that's how i got stuck with e-rich was parker called me e-rich because he doesn't know how to read that was uh that was literally the first time i'd ever seen that spelling that way too i hadn't been around a ton of german people so it was one of those i was like oh it's pronounced probably like it's spelled like e-rich well it depends if you were a high school guidance counselor uh or a bill collector <laughs> they would say e-rich because they didn't know how to fucking read um in german it was eddie which is the worst sounding fucking thing ever uh, but i went to the german school my mom was born in germany so mm-hmm. i went to the german merchant school growing up so nobody ever called me eric other than my mom so it was always Eddie or E. Rich, and like people just fucked it up. I'm like, it's not really that hard, like at all. Mm-hmm. But go figure. I was the last born. My brother's name, who's the second, was Todd. My sister, who was the first born, is Lisa. So my mom waited till her last kid to decide to like fuck it. I'm just gonna spell <laughs> this shit all wrong. Like <laughs> older brother, older sister, their name's normal. She's like, I'm gonna get even with this motherfucker. <laughs> like I never had the pencil with my name written on it in school. My mom used to have to like go by the gold marker pen and like add the H to the pencil <laughs> so that like I would be the cool kid, like so I could feel accepted because you know Germans are very accepting as it is. So like being accepted. <laughs> in a German class like oh you don't have the pencil with your name on it like no we're poor my mom spelled my name wrong so coming out of bar mill did like did you have the idea that this is something that you wanted to do permanently or was it more of like this is just kind of something fun to do on the side like when did you kind of take a look at it and go this is something I can do full time for a long time well the ne- the the next step for me the bar Milwaukee thing was it was just an acceptance thing. It was cool because like I hung out there. I knew the music I liked and I loved it. And I felt like the shit that the way I liked playing music wasn't really being followed by a lot of people. Not that it was anything special or neat or interesting. It was just I kind of liked everything and I didn't really follow a lot of the norms. Like I had no problem playing a country record and then a fucking death metal record and then some housey shit I like and then some fucking West Coast gangster hip hop. Like 
all that made sense to me. So I wasn't, you know, worried about key and worried about the, like all the traditional norms that you have for DJ. And I was like, I just like music and there's gotta be more people like me. Mm-hmm. So moving from there, uh, I actually stopped for about two years. I did a couple gigs at bar and then, um, didn't really get back into it until it was uh, cut up in YB. Um, I used to go see those dudes. I met them at the old Sydney high building one night it was uh, mad hatter and cut up. And I think YB was just, their caretaking what was the old city high building the sydney high is where oh sydney sydney high, high sorry. okay not city high that's a the i was yeah. like i was like what city high not the song okay the crackhead song yeah city high sorry it was at the old city high building they used to have these like crazy rooftop parties so i saw mad hatter and cut up doing a four table set and i was hanging out with a uh, dj aaron wade he used to be on msc and uh i was like Oh, this is fun. Because, like, I didn't party in high school. I didn't go to house parties very much. And if I did, it was all, like, theater nerds. So, like, it was everybody sitting around watching fucking nerd shit and not, Newsies. Like, well, <laughs> it, kind of, it was Blues Brothers for a senior English class and just shit like that. Rocky Horror Picture Show. But it was never, like, you know, nobody sat around with decks because we were all poor kids. So nobody had turntables and shit. Um mm-hmm. So we didn't really party like that. But when I saw a cut up in YB and those dudes, I'm like, oh, this is like fun. And it made sense to me, like without whatever they were doing, even though I had no idea what they were doing, it, it made sense. It felt right. So from there, I started hanging out with them at Barossa and like kind of following those dudes around a lot. And then I finally had enough money. I got a tax return. It was like 2004, 2005. I got my tax return and it was enough to buy a pair of used decks. And I'm like, thank God, like 600 bucks, all I ever needed. So I bought decks and then thank God I had a good line of bullshit to tell people and they bought into it, or at least I knew enough people that people would come out. So I got my first residency like inside a year Mm -hmm. and I was doing at room 434. I was doing Tuesdays um, with J bar and we got paid 30 bucks a night that we split. (laughs) Yeah, it was great, but it was cool. Cause like all vinyl, obviously there's no Serato. There's none of that shit yet. So, you know, you're digging through your vinyl and, you know, spending a hundred bucks a weekend buying new vinyl at Lotus land. And then, you know, making 30 of it back next week it wasn't exactly the best business venture ever, but it was fun. And like the, there's a certain romance of digging for vinyl and like sitting in a musty ass basement, just, you know, flipping through fucking records. And you come across this one gem that's, you know, two bucks. It's a throwaway to somebody else. And you're like, it's the holy grail. You're like, holy shit, I can't believe like, you know, I have this vinyl in front of me. And that's when I was completely hooked. Like I was all in. And then, um, my day job, I, I worked in radio for a while, which makes sense because my mother always told me I had a face for radio. So <laughs> I, uh, I was working in radio at V100 and I was doing sales and I did it for about two years and they fucked me out of like five grand on a commission check. And I literally waited till the check deposited that day on a Wednesday. I saw it was in my account and I just fucking slid a resignation letter and I quit. And I've been DJing since. So did, like, how did that come about where it was just like that? they weren't paying or they were waiting for a payment or they were just trying to dick you like they I'm not always the best at following rules which is probably why I'm self-employed but um, they had a weird like commission structure on a project and when I did it they under the assumption that I was going to get paid like 20 points on it and then when I got my check they gave me like five points on it and it was, I mean, we're talking like a 30 or $40,000 deal. So I was mm-hmm. like, yo, like you owe me a couple grand here. That's not what we agreed to. And they're like, no, that's what it is. And they just, it, it's corporate sales, dude. They just push and push and push. They don't give a fuck. You know, that's why everybody who works in radio. It's like a revolving door. Like mm-hmm. you work for a station for two years, you burn out, you go take over someone else's list elsewhere, burn out, go to the next place. And then you come back to where you used to be. You know, it's like people that moved to Colorado, like Eric, they go away. They always end up fucking coming back. So, <laughs> Um, but that's why I was just, I was fed up with it and I was, you know, working 80 hours a week. It was just fucking stupid. Plus still trying to DJ. I was DJing at most with YB. We were doing our backspin Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. Um, the Tuesdays I was doing at room 434 and then I just started guesting. Um, I was doing once a month at the wicked hop. Um, Jordan was still in charge. DJ Mad Hatter from 88, nine, um, was running the music and everything over there. And he did the Wednesday hip hop night. So on Fridays he brought me in, uh, miss Erica Jean, uh, who's back in Wisconsin now, uh, Tariq from 89. Wait, she moved back? Yeah. She was out in Washington, right? Yeah. I haven't seen her in years. I think I went to her going away party. Yep. Uh, she was friends with my old roommate, uh, Jeffy Joseph. And I I think she was spinning too for a bit too, wasn't she? Yeah, she spun for a long time. Her big, uh, she loved Britpop. Yeah. She was big into like British music. She did, uh, what was that joint that's right next? We, w- we went to go see Reverend uh, Peyton's Big Damn Band. Mm-hmm. 
there was that oh it used to be yield that was yeah. right next to it she used to play there right mm-hmm. Oh, I totally remember this. Yeah, now. she played all over. She's played at three. She used to play all over. Um, so we did Fridays. It was a revolving thing. Um, it was uh, the reggae dub dudes, Max and the guys. Uh, then it was Tariq, um, and then it was Erica, and then it was me. So everybody kind of had uh, like a fine tuned kind of vibe that they were going with. Like Tariq and the eighty eight nine guys were very like underground, cool stuff. Uh, Erica was very much so into a Brit pop phase and kind of a little bit all over the board um, because she was very dexterous. She knew a shit ton of music. Um, And then the dub reggae dudes, that was Max and those dudes. Awesome. Like, that was what they were into. I didn't really have a sound. My my style was a lack of style. So I just came up and it was basically like throw as much shit at the wall and hope something sticks. So, you know, I'm playing New Jack Swing records and I'm playing rock music and then I'm playing hip hop and then I'm playing, you know, the seven EDM records I knew at the time and, you know, just kind of jumping all over the board, but it kind of stuck. So then after a couple months, um, they asked me to take over full time on Fridays. So I was there. Well, technically, I guess I'm still there, but it was 13 years before the pandemic shut down. Yeah. Um, that I was holding down Fridays there. That's that's really kind of interesting. Like, I remember, like, my idea of that was I remember, like, seeing, like, AM at mm-hmm. Pure in Vegas, and he was playing everything under the sun. Mm-hmm. Like, it was one of those that he would go out of, like, like a Sleepy Brown Outcast record, yep. and then he would go into journey and then it was he would cut into something else and he would cut into something else and it was just like this rapid fire of like basically having like a a hundred disc cd changer Mm -hmm. and what was like along the same beat range or the same bpms and like what would be played at that beat range if someone just random find like a hundred player cd player well and a lot of that came from like z trip and djp uh, those two dudes, I mean, they're kind of the originators of the mashup back then. I mean, you're talking early to mid nineties, but like uneasy listening by Z trip is one of the most fucking amazing mixtapes ever. Cause a, it's done all vinyl. It's mm-hmm. all like live. I mean, obviously there's edits, but like it's all done with vinyl. There's no fucking trickery here of, you know, cue points and stuff like that. But that's where they're doing like, you know, Pat Benatar acapellas over like far side beats and shit. Like just wild, like uh, Lisa Loeb stay, <laughs> like just <laughs> weird shit like that. And I heard it. I was like, yeah, this is what I'm into. And then unfortunately it turned into the mashup craze where you got fucking idiot dudes uh the computer mashup uh, girl talk there oh i know you, yeah i was gonna say you would stand talk. on yeah i would stand on stage wearing a shirt that said i'm not a dj meanwhile taking money out of dj pockets and everybody's like yo this shit's next level like dude took an acapella and put it over an instrumental there's no rhyme to reason there's no like i the thing i liked about a lot of the like the earlier mashup stuff is there was like there was thought behind it. Like there was a theme or there was, you know, a wordplay or something like that. It wasn't just like, Oh, this is 84 beats per minute. This is 84 beats per minute. They belong together. Mm-hmm. Like I think mashups and it sucks because everything then was a mashup. Like that whole era was just every possible, like, let me take a four bar loop of a fucking Linda Ronstadt track and then take, you know, drums from cheap trick and then layer a big Rob wreck. Like, like what the fuck are you doing? Like, but people got into it cause it was different. Yeah. But like, it was just, I don't know. I hated that style of DJing I always thought it was kind of like uh not necessarily an homage but like uh, a taking of like the 80s and 90s where people were sampling old records and mm-hmm. turning them into new hip-hop records and then like all of a sudden people discovered like oh that was an old 70s record like that shit that PD made like oh shit like I want to try and do something like that like sampling of, of different records and stuff like that like, yeah I always thought like to me that made sense because of the fact that like you and I being the age that we are and the the age of hip-hop that we grew up around like technically P Diddy was a mashup artist. He took like seventies records and dropped Biggie and himself over them and shit like that. Well, see, but see, I don't consider that a mashup. I consider, I mean, hip hop was born out of uh, the way hip hop was created. It was a necessity of poor. Like so many of these artists didn't, I mean, so many of the hip hop artists were, didn't have the financing, didn't have the money to work in these big studios and stuff. So the only way they didn't have, you know, money for AR machines and all these, like the fancy beat makers and, you know, 808s and shit like that. So, the only way they could actually create these beats were taking drum loops and then looping them and recording them in a tape and then going back and, you know, redoing it. That was the only way they could make the music because that's the only, like, seven bucks for a record was a lot cheaper than 300 bucks for a beat machine, you know, and a sampler. So, like, that part of hip-hop I always loved because it was literally taking something and, you know, making something entirely new out of it. Like, that part I always respect, and that was one of my favorite things about hip-hop because it was like, oh, like, 
shit, I never thought about that. Was the other day, my buddy and I were driving around listening to just samples. You know, we were listening to, like, David McCallum, The Edge, you know, the next episode sample. And then I was playing Tom Scott Today, and, like, you hear these little, like, one-bar riffs in a throwaway jazz record. And, and then it's, that. like, the biggest hip-hop record, you know, like, Bob James' Nautilus. How many songs have been sampled off that? Dude's made more money off that song being sampled than he ever did as a mainstream jazz artist. Yeah. So, like, that part of hip-hop I always loved. That's why I hated the mashup shit because, to me, it just it felt – it was, like, any idiot with Ableton and 400 bucks can do this. Well, did you feel the same way about, like, Paul's Boutique when Rick Rubin did that? Or? No. Cause, I mean, they're the ones who broke the mold. Yeah. Like, they absolutely uh, – I read somewhere a couple years back that, like, if they – wanted to make that album this was like five or ten years ago for them to make that album um and half the samples they couldn't get clearance but if they did that the clearance uh, the sample clearance would have cost almost like 30 million dollars yeah like led zeppelin doesn't let anyone no. use their music for anything no no and no. i remember like there's led like there's led zeppelin drums in there and and I think he was sam- I think he, they sampled guitars too. They, they sampled every. They literally threw everything at it, and I, I think it's an absolute masterpiece of music. But to me, that's where the delineation is. They took it, made their own beats out of it, and then made a new song out of it. What I don't like is taking a four-bar loop from a instrumental or from a you know from a hook or a refrain or you know especially like '90s music where they have like the super long fucking refrain at the second half of the song. There's always the like 32-bar outro or the you know like the funky mix version type shit. Yeah, but like taking that looping it and then just running an acapella of another popular song over it was just lame to me like that wasn't i don't know i didn't like if you actually did it and did some production then i thought it was cool so like when you had um like the old danger mouse stuff like the purple tape the gray tape oh like that shit where they took you know the Beatles stuff but it wasn't just a loop like they would use it and then they would layer more drums under it so at least it still had a bit of a hip-hop vibe and stuff like that like that stuff i dug but just taking a loop like me taking the guitar riff from like back in black running that at 94 bpm on a loop and then cutting over next episode acapella over it like that's not rocket science yeah. like there's there's nothing earth shattering about that djs have been doing that for fucking ever <laughs> i actually i just introduced callie because she, she for whatever reason she hates the beatles i don't and, blame her I, I i can't fucking stand them either and i was i was explaining to her i was like you know the white the white album is probably like their their masterpiece and i was explaining to her i was like yo it's like there's this and i'm like i'm going through the track listing of it and i'm playing like little bits and pieces of it and then i was like and you have to understand i was like you know out of this came more art i was like i explained to her danger mouse and then i started pulling up tracks from that and i would play back like we were listening to i think um rocky raccoon and i was mm-hmm. like now hear this and I'm like, now hear it redone. And she was like, this is the same record. I was like, to, to be able to explain that to someone who doesn't have a musical background mm-hmm. and then just watching their head explode, mm-hmm. trying to process it is just absolutely amazing. I remember hearing the Danger Mouse Gray album right at like not too long after the Black album came out and just being completely floored because that was something like, like the White album was something I grew up listening to. Right. And then being able to hear that redone and I could hear what he was doing because I at that point I had a great understanding of uh, DAWs where it was or excuse me a digital audio workstation where like I could hear I was like oh he chopped it here he chopped and Mm -hmm. then he just kept pasting here and that was to me just completely mind-blowing that he just took it and went in a completely different direction that was also pretty ballsy of Jay-Z to release the instrumental and the acapella for that album which no one does anymore for any other shit no well you can thank rock band for also ruining that for the that's part of the reason that shit came out because when they released rock band um they had all the original stems yeah and that's why all the old artists they're like yeah we're not fucking with you anymore because that's how a lot of that shit got released i remember tim uh kid cut up was huge on that with the stem files because I, I have a bunch at home even that are like you literally you can get a message in a bottle by the police but you can get you know Stuart copeland's drum track by itself and then you have sting's guitar and the other dude from the police that nobody ever remembers his fucking name but andy then, summers oh yeah that's oh. the other one um but like, so they have like each individual thing broken down and from a music standpoint, it was awesome, but you never ever would have access to any of that shit. Otherwise, uh, there was a DJ locally who will remain nameless who, uh, applied for the bucks thing when you and I were going for the bucks thing. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's how they ended up doing their entire, uh, defense chant and all that is they actually ended up ripping 
uh, they used an Xbox, which is how they got all the stems for Rock Band, but they ended up ripping NBA 2K, and they stole all the chants from NBA 2K and used that so that they sounded super polished. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they're a working DJ, and they did well for themselves, but I was like, ooh, that's dirty. Because like, I played it, so I remember hearing that shit, I'm like, that's from the fucking game, you cheater. Like, you're going to get sued. <laughs> and of course, they're like, oh, dude, this is awesome. They sound way better than you dipshits. And I'm like, oh, they yeah, ch- they cheated. But yeah, uh, no, the, the, the mashup thing, like I said, I thought if you actually do it as art and you put shit together in an artistic way, then I, I dig it. Like, if you build from it, but just taking it and looping it, I think is lame. And that was what I had a problem with, so like, with all that shit, where it just became everything, like any random song like just be the more opposite they could be and i get like the novelty of it and like there's fun like there there's music that needs to be fun and novel and stupid but like the people that were doing it were taking themselves so seriously like you'd watch like the cats out of san francisco that always do like the dj earworm and stuff like the the early stuff that they were doing for their like year-end mashup yeah. stuff was so like just cornball like just over the top cheese. And then, I mean, as it progressed and as they got better at their craft, it, it improved quite a bit, but just like that whole era where everybody was like, cause everybody would walk up to you. Well, can you mash this up? I remember being at the club playing like whatever the fuck, you know, 50 cent record. Well, can you, can you mash this up? Like it's perfectly good by itself. Like there's some songs that, yeah, like in a time and place, but I don't know. I feel like nuance is often lost in what we do these days. My, uh, <laughs> Like, I, f- I find it hard. I don't know if you agree or disagree with me. Like, I find it really hard for, like, new hip-hop. For me, when I'm listening to it, like, I have a really hard time, like, getting behind something that doesn't have a beat to it throughout the entire record where there's just, like, huge breakdowns or, like, how do I put this? Like, new Chris Brown records don't hit the same way to me. Like, it's just one of those where it's, like, like unless it's, like, a, a Pete Down version of it, uh, there's a joke in that Chris Brown. I, I can see your fucking hamster. I was, no, 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 no. I wasn't gonna say anything about beat down. No, um, Pete down, not beat down. You said Chris Brown, so I thought beat down. Uh, uh, yeah, well, you should just change that subject. Um, no, Pete down's fantastic, by the way. And this is uh, Pete down two thousand dot blogspot dot com, where I used to rip all of his fucking edits every possible week. Um, dude, him and Party Ben were like two that I constantly yeah. like, ripped off. Like when that B more shit was going on. Dude, I have I probably have like a thousand Pete Down records in my fucking Serato. Way more Pete Down than Yeezy. Yeah. But uh no, I, I agree with you, but this is officially the get off my lawn we're old white dude segment. But like it's the hip uh, music evolves, right? Like the the hip hop that we loved in the uh, in the 90s is one thing. 90s I mean there's a reason why it's referred to as a golden era, but like even moving forward into like the super jiggy era, you know, locks and Diddy and all the like late nineties, early two thousands, your Nelly, you know, all the Luda, like all the just like larger than life personalities, you know, flaunting cash and all that. It had to go somewhere. So then it tried to, you know, the market tried to correct itself when we went into like backpacker rap, you know, early Kanye and then your little brother and all, you know, a lot of these underground hip hop artists and that shit was awesome and we loved it, but people still wanted to party and Ninth Wonder, as talented as he is, it's kind of hard to like get loose to a Ninth Wonder record. So, I mean, you think about how big the Neptunes were at that point. I mean, I still think it's hilarious that they literally produced three of the four songs that were up for record of the year. And then Dr. Dre won producer of the year. <laughs> like three of the four songs were produced by them. They had a 75% and Dre still won. it. I mean, talk about one, a one B of like all time greats, but like it, there was such a shift musically where it became like party, party, party. And I miss that. It was up tempo party. Yeah. And then coming out of that, we moved into the, you know, this is where I really started doing club shit. And I remember being pissed that I had to play like 80 BPM hip hop. So like, all your, you know, young jock and, you know, walk it out was up tempo, but it was still a slower tempo record. Yeah. Um, snappy fingers, like all the, you know, the little John influence stuff, the Southern stuff was so slow, throw some D's, Paul wall, like all that stuff was like the slow hip hop. And I was like, this is brutal. I'm used to playing this up tempo stuff, but that's where the market shifted to. Cause it wanted something new. Mm-hmm. And then out of that slow down, version then we got into this like stripper anthem shit where it was like 62 bpms and i'm like 
it it always reminded me of like in the uh, like mid nineties where there would be like the huge like pop ballad. So like, like Tony Braxton, like uh, unbreak my, my heart. heart. Yeah. Right. And then some fucking, you know, Felix the house cat or, you know, whoever would come by and just lay up a fucking 120 BPM, like house track underneath and boop. All of a sudden we got an instant house record taking some slow ass ballad. And that's kind of what it felt like. Cause we were taking all these like slow ass hip hop songs. And then the EDM dude to just come in and layer in some, you know, four on the floor, 128 BPM thing underneath. And you're like, oh, look, now you can kind of dance to it because it's not the slowest shit ever. Yeah. And I mean, for me, that was like that was hard, but like I eventually adjusted. Like I got this like it was that was a drag for me. Like I remember when when grill like Nelly's grill it's like it was Nelly, Paul Wall. Like mm-hmm. that was like kind of like my first introduction to that where like that was something that was kind of a pop hip hop record. But it was something I had to figure out, like how to play. Well, and it was hard to work with because the 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 bedrock, the foundations of your sets, the stuff that you had, your core stuff you went to, wasn't in that tempo. Exactly. So, like being able to navigate there and navigate out of it effectively was difficult because you didn't. Ha- I mean, you could always just do your scratch drop, right? Like everyone's got their. You drop it takes two. You drop poison. You drop whatever. You just scratch drop it in and do the abrupt like reset of the room. But if you were trying to like blend your way in and out of it but the only thing you could do to get out of that shit was play like super cornball eighties. Yeah. Like you were playing take on me, you were playing footloose or you're playing like wake me up before you go, go like that was the shit you had to use to get out of that tempo. And then hopefully you could, you know, ramp up or you're, you know, playing drum and bass perhaps, but ramp up and go into something else. Yeah. It was a, uh, it was tough, but what helped me figure out and like how to navigate that was, was the fact that like I, and it's, it's part of the reason why like, I'm having a trouble now with readjusting coming out of the pandemic is being able to watch how the crowd goes. Like that was one of my hardest things was was coming out of this not DJing for a while and then like having to do like a couple of gigs in September and October and then having to do New Year's. Like I remember like asking around and being like, hey, like I don't want to get paid for anything. Like if you have a crowd that shows up, like I literally just want to come in and work shit out and see what works because it was one of those that music music to me at least is one of those that there's a ton of great music out there but what what's hard to figure out is what works so it's not like you can just kind of do a stream and then get positive feedback from that like you have to be able to see like our heads moving are people like mouthing the words are they getting into it well i think now is a dangerous time in all fairness for that uh because there's so much, I think we came out of an era where all of us, and I'm certainly guilty of this, and I'm sure you'd admit you are too, where we were so concerned about alienating the crowd that we like basically turned into just kiss asses, right? Like mm-hmm. we're taking, we're, you know, we're hitting the fucking layup, you know, the slow pitch underhand down the middle of the plate. We're swinging every time. Like a lot of us lost our balls quite frankly, and I'm the most guilty of anybody. Like, I go back and I think about the shit I played in 2007, 2008 in a packed room where, like, uh, yeah, I was obviously playing Pitbull and whatever big room shit I needed to play, but I'd still sneak in, you know, uh, like, I have a huge affinity for, like, British Mm R&B. Like, it's a weird thing, but, like, I fucking love British R&B, like, the whole, everything about it. But, like, sneaking in, like, almost like garagey type, you know, beat stuff that aren't, weren't necessarily big hits, but were like total fucking jams to you, like Daniel Manny, uh, Merriweather and shit like that, or the old Mark Ronson stuff that wasn't, you know, the big hit stuff. We played that and people wouldn't necessarily go nuts, but like we pushed the envelope. And then I think I hear a lot from people who bitch, you know, and they're going out downtown and this isn't knocking any DJ by any stretch because I'm more guilty than anybody on it. But like a lot of people are getting pissed because they're like, dude, if I go here, I go here, I go here. I hear the same fucking set, you know? And like I said, I'm certainly guilty of it. And it's because we started doing layups. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go up and play whatever the big hit is, you know, like you can play six Megan, the stallion songs in a row right now and then play seven Cardi B records and people are all going to be happy. It's also different because social media is so much more important now than when we were younger, you know, when, thank God, when we started DJing, people didn't have camera phones, you know, imagine the amount of fucking train wrecks that would have been put up on Instagram of us, <laughs> no you shit. know, yeah. like trying to handle a shot, talk to a customer, your record runs out and you try to play it off. Like, but so I think, 
I, I, what I'm excited about going back to music is being, a, and it's also because obviously I'm 41. I, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I'm getting to the end of my rope. Like I'm not going to be doing this when I'm 50. So I have less to lose, I guess, is the way I view it. So part of me going back, I'm like, fuck it. Like, I'm kind of like, yeah, I'm, I'm obviously trying to entertain. Like, I hate DJs whose whole goal is to, like, teach, right? The, that The shit's over. Like, we have the internet now. We don't need DJs to break new records. People know about their shit long before we even usually do. But, like, pushing the envelope, playing, you know, an album cut instead of playing, you know, and doing video, obviously, is a whole different can of worms. But just in general, and speaking of the music, like, we got hired for a reason. And if you have a good ear and you know, like, you hear shit, you like it, right? Like, whatever the record may be that you're into, play it. And if it doesn't work the first time, play it again. Play it again. But we're so quick to pull, you know. The one that always comes to my mind is Robin Thicke, Blurred Lines. I heard that, like, I forgot how I even heard it, but I got, like, a fucking shitty, like, 128 clean rip of it. And I played it three or four months before it hit the radio. And I was like, this is a fucking jam. And obviously it was, because I didn't put two and two together that it was a Marvin Gaye song that he basically stole. But yeah. um, but I was like, this is hot. This is fucking great. And it was one of the few songs I ever played, even without a video. Like, I just, I played it constantly, because I thought it was such a great song. And it didn't go over at all. Like people would just be like, eh, because they hadn't heard it on the radio yet. And then all of a sudden, three months later, all of a sudden I look like I actually know what I'm doing, which is very rare to happen. But in this case it did. And people were like, yo, this song's fucking great. And I'm like, yeah, I know. It's kind of like high fidelity. Like, I know. Yeah, I know. But, <laughs> but yeah, but for every one of those, keep in mind, I've probably got 50 where I was like, no, this, this is going to be the lick. Like this is really good take off. And then everyone else is like, yeah, dude, we don't get it. You're an idiot. Like, it's tough. Like my some of my favorite times of playing a room is when it's early. Like oh, the yeah. people the people that come out early, their expectations aren't high and it's just one <laughs> So I get in great because people are like, "Hey, as long as you're not fucking not playing music, you're doing better than I expected." So the the point that I'm getting at is this is that they know it's you kind of have to wait for the room to fill up a little bit before you start dropping like just straight heat. But it was always fun to like warm up with like those new records that like I listened to. Like when I remember I went, I went on a trip to um, the Virgin Islands. I went and visited Dan and Maggie Taylor. And that was like right around the time that like Kygo was breaking. Mm-hmm. And I kept hearing like that style of beat being in the Caribbean. You just hear that a ton. And I remember coming back and being like, dude, that was so tight. Like, I remember, like, a lot of what I do is, like, I'll hear something, I'll sound hound it, and I'm like, oh, when I'm, like, when I'm pulling up records of, like, stuff to find on whatever record pool that I'm looking at, like, I'll start pulling up, like, oh, is this available? Is this available? Like, sometimes I'm a little ahead, and sometimes there isn't anything available for it yet. But, um, uh, oh, hey, by the way, uh, Scott Cushman says what's up. They're, uh, hi, hi, Scott Cushman. They are, uh, they are in Atlantic City. Oh, you know what? They're out there for the PFL thing. Uh, shout out to Laura Sanchez. Um, I think she fights next next week. She's in the women's 155 tournament. I, for uh, Scott scares the shit out of me. I, saw, <laughs> I, I, I was at um, a bar that's no longer a bar. Uh, was it the one across the street? No, it was one that uh, got Greek lightning or caught on fire. But he was working, oh, okay. working security for said establishment, and a drunk dude came in. Um and said something unkind to Scott, which if you just look at Scott, you don't, you would just want to hug him because the dude's fucking terrifying. Like <laughs> the nicest guy ever, but fucking terrifying. And, uh, <laughs> we were sitting there. I was with, uh, my whole Milwaukee street crew and, uh, the, the twins who own the establishment. So we're partying, drinking. There's a fucking blizzard on the East side. Just like out of nowhere, we got 13 inches of snow one March night. It was just wild. Mm-hmm. And this dude's trying to come in. And he and his girl are in, and they're just causing a fucking ruckus. And so they informed the dude and the girl that it was time to go. Mm -hmm. And Scott was pleasant until it was time not to be pleasant. And uh, the dude came in, and like Scott pushed him out the door or whatever. And then the girl came back and came at him and was like in his face, like 110 pounds of fury. Like she was just going to fucking ruin dude. You know, like she was just not having it. Fuck you and da 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 And he like basically put her in a bear hug and walked her and used her shoulder to open the door and then placed her outside. <laughs> and the dude came back and he did some kick to the inner part of his knee and that was the first time I ever saw a knee start doing like this. And I was like, 
ew, that's gross. I'm a big pussy because no. And then, yeah, that was that was the first time I uh, actually met that man. And to this day, I'm still fucking terrified of him. <laughs> He's a big teddy bear. Man. Yeah, I'm sure he is. And Vula is beloved. Yeah. It is fantastic. But. Vula is amazing. What was I saying right before uh, right uh, before I, this? I'll run everything off. Oh, you're talking about record pools and Kygo. And, oh, okay. And, I remember what I was saying. The um, So, yeah, that whole like Afro beat sound, like I heard that and I was like, I absolutely love this. And that's like how I opened a lot of my sets was I was playing that. So there was so like I dove down that r- rabbit hole. I forgot what the website was. I want to say it was like BPM Supreme. Sure. And I would just like I would find like records that were like in that 95 to like 110 range. And as soon as I heard like a cool beat, I was like, that's a cool record. Mm-hmm. That's a cool record. That's a cool record. And I would start building these sets around where it was like. It was an interesting time too. Like alternative music had this like weird vibe to it. Like it wasn't EDM, it wasn't pop. Like I, I think about the fact that like I heard Halsey for the first time. Like when I first heard it, it was like on one hundred and two one. <laughs> it's so funny that you said that because that is my number one with a bullet artist. I fucking worship Halsey. Um, as soon as you started describing like it's not EDM, it's not this. I'm like yeah, like fucking castle by halsey i heard that shit and i was like what is this i need all of this in my fucking life new americana is what did it for me it was corny though grew on biggie and nirvana like shut the fuck up that's not uh nightmare is the jam oh yeah she goes fucking ham on that shit. she's just got like she's got those records that just go all over the board super talented ridiculously um, talented unbelievably talented um and everything that she does recently is just pure fire I do regret Vula had asked me to go see Halsey with her in Chicago. And she was like, <sighs> Scott said he's the only one that like you can go with, that I can go with. And I was like, number one, thank you. Uh, number I, two. I would go just so Scott didn't beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> like, yes, I'll pay. I'll drive. Yes, <laughs> yes, Mr. Cushman, sir. I forgot what came up. I think I was playing on the night that she said that she wanted to go. And I was like, fuck, yeah. I'm booked for a gig already or something like that. And I was like, I got to pass. I was like, I'd love to go, but. But it was in Chicago. I think it was at is either at the Allstate or is at the United Center. It was probably United Center. Yeah. But yeah, she's absolutely fantastic. But that I'm in the same boat. Like I, as we go back to work, and now as you know, like I'm doing Fridays at the backyard, and it's a totally different vibe, right? It's a corner bar in a neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. Super fun. Crowd tends to be a little bit older, so like they definitely like way more like album cut 90s hip hop 2000s stuff. I mean, it's not that different than a lot of other spots, but like I'm not banging out Calvin Harris records or like super up tempo stuff at all, you know. Um but I like the fact even like my Wednesdays that I was doing a Tin Widow where like it was Sam wanted me Sam and I had a long talk one night. Uh Sam Berman, the owner of Tin Widow, you should go spend lots of money there. It's a great little bar. But we um uh, amazing scotch and amazing gin collection. Yeah, like 300 bottles of, of gin. 300 bottles of gin and no sleeves. <laughs> Tank tops only behind the bar for Sam or jerseys. <laughs> um, but he and I were sitting here, and you got two short, pudgy, fucking white dudes talking about like Neo Soul records for hours on end, right? Like we go to have lunch, and we're talking about D'Angelo and Music Soul Child and all this stuff. And that's really where my heart was like, all that stuff, like Sade, Maxwell. Like that's the shit I absolutely love. But where the fuck am I going to play that? You yeah. know, like, unless you like, yeah, I could DJ your baby making session. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just in the air horn. like, <laughs> um, But, like, there's no avenue for that, you know? So Sam was able to work out a deal um, to get some sponsorship money and shit. So we were able to do that. So that's where, that's what I, what I do now for my, like, artistic fix is being able to do spots like that and do like these different venues where the expectation isn't fucking a raging dance party. Yeah. Cause I'm not raging dance party. Like it was, it's fun. And I think there's a time and a place and I'm not saying that we're too old to do it by any stretch. And we obviously still can, but there's another set. There's like a large section of people that go out that are being underserviced. And I think that's where like, these different rooms and having these different vibes. And if nothing else, streaming has shown us that people are willing to listen to different shit. Milwaukee's such a weird market though. Cause we're such fucking alcoholics here. It's drink first music. Second always has been. Yeah. That's why every like out of town DJ, like even back when I used to have budget at the wicked hop, we'd bring in 
some fairly big name DJs that were like playing in Chicago the next night or whatever. Like they were all friends of DJ Pickle who got us hooked up or even like Troublemaker. Troublemaker be, you know, playing a 5,000 person venue the next night and he's playing 250 people with me on a Friday at Jackalope. And he was amazed and a bunch of the DJs were of like, Milwaukee just, they want to drink. Like they want to party. Your job is not to annoy. Yeah. Like it's such a different vibe. And especially now with social media, like, you know, you laugh, I hop on, let me open up Instagram and click stories. And it's the same picture from like four different angles at every night, you know, and it's just, that's a generational thing. So yeah. like, I think there's still a fair amount of people that want to go out, you know, now that we actually have a middle class of people in their like thirties and early forties who don't necessarily have kids and didn't run away to the suburbs. They're still downtown. They still want to go out, but they don't necessarily want to hear, you know, like blaringly loud bottle service, sparkler stuff. And no knock on that. We both did that for years and like that needs to exist as well. But I think there's a market for this other stuff. And I think that's where a lot of us are slotting in. And it's cool. And I think, uh, if nothing else, shutting down and kind of hitting the reset button on the whole nightlife industry, I think when we open back up fully, I think you're going to see a lot more of, like, themed nights and stuff like that. I'm hoping so. Like, um, th- and the tough part is is it's hard for me to go out now just because it's one of those that it's, like, I've had this, conver- like, I've had this conversation with you before even this where it was like, I just came to see you at the backyard on Fridays when I was off. And it was because of the fact that I was like, I don't know where else I can go. Like, I want to go see my friends who DJ. Um, and at the same time, like, I don't want any type of bullshit where it's like, you have to sit down, you have to do this, so on and so forth. I still want to be supportive. Like when uh, there was a point, I think at the at June, where it was like RWB and like Trinity were like the only two places that had DJs. Mm-hmm. Like I was going out to RWB on a regular basis just to support like Declan and Quaddy and all those guys, just because of the fact that it was like, you know, I want to go hear records and I want to see how stuff reacts in a room. Well, a a quick aside before you finish that big kudos to Jake and the team over there, Jake and uh, Jimmy and everybody like for them, Gavin, sorry, Gavin. Um, But like, they were one of the first ones that reached out when everything shut down that a, they said, we've got you on the books for like two more months. We'll pay you for the gigs. And then you'll just like, if you want the cash up front, like we'll pay you and then you can, you know, we'll offset it once we open back up, whatever. But like they went out of their way when a lot of spots didn't to like keep DJs as long as they humanly could. So, uh, Say what you will about RWB. I, I've, I have a very soft, obviously, Bar Milwaukee, it's a very soft spot for me, but like yeah. it was super cool. They were one of the first and only spots that were like their initial reaction after, you know, their immediacy of their staff was like, wait, our DJs are our staff. They're not just people, you know, a lot of spots, they love us until they don't need to love us. Yeah. <laughs> um, we're a commodity. And that was one of the rare times where I've actually felt like appreciated. Like they were like, no, like, are you okay? Can we help you out? Like, that was super cool. So sorry, I just wanted to give them no, the no, proper no. credit there. No, I'm 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 glad you brought it up just because of the fact that you know a lot of people don't see the behind the scenes, and that's that's a lot of what this podcast is about. I mean, as much as it is about nerding out about, <laughs> just, just wait till I'm ready to quit. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna smoke a blunt, throw on some Matchbox Twenty, and we're getting fucking wild, man. Like. Just wait till I'm ready to quit this game. Like, hold on. <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. You're cool. You're cool. Like, oh, my God. My Billy Madison hit list when I'm ready to give up the game. <laughs> but, now, um, I'll have to start a Patreon just for that show. <laughs> but, I mean, I you know, I think back to, you know, when everything was shut down, they were having DJs at RWB, and they were one of the first people to do a club stream. Yeah, and like I remember tuning in for it, where it was like they had all the lights going and like Quaddy and someone else was playing too. Where it was like, and that's that's the other crazy thing too is that like with the level of technology that we're at right now, I just installed an app on Apple TV and I'm watching my friend DJ who lives down the street, or I'm watching my buddy, you know, Quaddy who's playing records and like there there's a chat thing going so on and so forth, and I'm texting like, hey, what's up, dude? I'm tuned in, and then next thing you know, it's like. Hey Parker, what's up, bro? Thanks for tuning in. Blah blah blah. And you're like, holy shit, dude! Like, it's, it's cra- wild. It's it's a wild concept. Streaming, streaming. Oh, man, I could talk for. We could do three shows just on streaming. Um, I had first started it like five years ago. Um, I had bought. Sorry, I told totally you was the most DJ thing ever. Like, I was way into it like five <laughs> years ago. I mean, now it's whatever. But um, no, I. 
actually, uh, yeah, fuck it. Uh, Rufio and I got into a fight. We got into a fucking pissing contest because we're effectively brothers, and we that's what happens when you work with somebody for that long. Like, we got into an argument, and fuck you, and fuck you, and I'm not working, and you're not fired, and whatever, and blah, blah, blah. So I literally bought all the shit I needed to do streaming. And I was like, fuck you. I'll just stream. I'll DJ from home, and you can suck a dick, right? Because mm-hmm. I'm spiteful and a two-year-old, and so is Nate. That's why we didn't get along at the time. So, for the record, we're completely fine now, but this was years ago. Um, so... I went out and bought all the shit and I first started doing it on Twitch and I think I made it like 45 seconds before they fucking shut me off. Like I forget, it was Aaliyah. I was playing Aaliyah. I was like, Nope, copyright. Boop. Done. I was wow, like, Oh, that quick back. In the oh day? yeah. So I was like, well, fuck this. So then it was, it was some European website. I can't remember what it was, but like, it, cause Europe is just the fucking wild, wild west, right? Like there's no like, intellectual property laws be damned like they don't give a fuck about trademark copyright nothing they're like yeah whatever bootleg it we don't give a shit so i was streaming on one of those and uh i did it like one night and i think i got like two people to watch it and i was like all right like this sucks like this isn't fun and then so that's why i lucked out when everything shut down i still had everything i needed to do like i had computer hardwired and routers the whole thing cameras the whole shebang so that's why i mean the first week we were locked down he came over to my house like I yeah think we shut down that sunday was our last day and the bars closed monday i think and then that thursday you and i were streaming at my house yeah like don't get me wrong not that we know much more now but we sure shit didn't know what the fuck we were doing then but like you know set it up and you go live and it was such like streaming is so weird. Like I know you did it for a while and it's just, it's so frustrating because at the end of the day, we're all ego fucking maniacs, right? Like half the reason people get into this is they want attention. Like yeah. I don't care what anybody says you do this cause you like attention. Most, most people do. So, um, and obviously you have to have a love of music and all, but like when you take people like us who've been doing this shit for 20 years, and even if you've been doing it for 20 weeks, like you just, you need that interaction. Like for me, I've always told anybody when they've asked me like what my style of music was, I was like, I don't necessarily care what I play as long as I'm getting the vibe. Like I want to have parties. Like I want people to come together, hang out, relax, like cut loose. So if one night that's me playing fucking George Strait country records and the crowd's going ham, fine. If the next week is me playing like, west coast early 90s like e40 shit perfect whatever it takes i don't care as long as we're having a fun you know and we're all shared in this experience so when you take that away and now i'm standing in a room by myself staring at a little camera and then a little screen over here and you know some fucking anonymous trolls like hey here's you know i'll tip you three dollars if you play fucking celine dion seven times in a row like I think people's hearts were in the right place. Like they were trying to be supportive, but it just felt so demeaning. Like it was just, you felt like I was just brutal. It was like you were a monkey on a string. It was yeah. like, cause you can't like there's DJs, like somebody like cut up. Right. And I, I go to him cause he's by far the most hands on talented dude I've ever fucking seen in my life. He can DJ that way in front of a stadium with 50,000 people as he's done on tour with pink and Cher and everybody else he's toured with, but he can do the same performance in his bedroom in front of a camera and make it work too. and make it work. I am not wired that way. Cause my problem is if I don't have energy, then I'm DJing and I look at the camera and then I look at my phone. Then I go off camera, hit my pen, go back on, like try to read the chat. Like it's just so it's, it's not DJ and plus nobody like the, the shift in the streaming thing turned into, it was like, it was basically a shout out show. Yeah. Um, and that's why I stopped doing it because it literally, it wasn't even about playing music anymore. And I get like a lot of people that would come out and see DJs all the time. Like you develop friendships with them and so on and so forth. And you miss your friends. Like you want to see your people. So it'd be cool when people would like hop on, you know, and if they hopped in the chat, like, Hey, what's up E or whatever. Like, Hey dude, like, I don't mind saying hi, but like so many people that watch streaming just want to hear their name said. And it's like, yo, I'm fucking playing music. Like, I mean, hi, like, thanks. Like, thank you. I, I really much appreciate it. But like, I'm trying to entertain some people and like, I'm here to play music. Nobody gives a fuck. Ironic that I'm saying nobody cares about what I think on a podcast, but, um, (laughs) 
but for real, like I'm DJing, like fuck do I like, no, this isn't therapy. I'm not your counselor. I'm a fucking DJ. I'm playing music. Like we're just trying to have fun. But like people like, and when I watch streaming now and no knock on those dudes, like that's, uh, and women, sorry, I gotta stop doing that. Um, but like that's their hustle. Like they enjoy that, but I miss DJs. I saw somebody, uh, I, was, I follow Jazzy Jeff on Twitter cause you know, greatest DJ ever. And, uh, somebody tweeted him like, Hey, shut the fuck up. I'm trying to hear you play music, not talk the entire day. And I'm like, yo, like one ill. Cause you don't speak to Jazzy. Jeff. I mean, dude's a fucking living legend. Yeah. But B like, I kind of know where you're coming from. Cause a lot of DJs I listen to, I'm like, you're so dope. And a lot of them that like, I would never get a chance to, you know, there's so many great DJs, uh, Alex Mendez, audio one. Who's yeah. Recovering in California. And it was everybody in the fucking world. Right. Like I would never get to see him DJ. Cause he's on the West coast or if he's, you know, on tour and he's coming near here, he's going to Chicago and I'm probably working. So I'm not going to be able to go see him, but like being able to sit at home and like watch my man do his shit live. Like it's so dope to see all these DJs that like you hear about and you, you, you bond with online via Twitter and social media and whatnot. But like, you don't necessarily get to ever see what they can do other than the promo video. And like, obviously the promo video is always perfect. Right. Yeah. Like, so like, but seeing that these people that you look up to, not even necessarily look up to, but like that you look at as like, Oh, like they're my level or they're above my level or whatever on a different part of the world, having the same, you know, issues that I have, you know, like, you know, USB dropout here, like, you know, just the, the humanizing of them was so fucking cool. But then all that got stripped away because now like I watched a lot of these shows and they're like, I mean, everyone's got to make their money, make yeah. your money. However, and if that's profitable for you, that's fine. But like, doing like this just super gimmicky shit like you know throw f up in the chat and this i'm like what the fuck are we doing dude like it works for them and they make money but i'm like this isn't djing to me like this isn't what this isn't the shit i fell in love with well it's, it it goes back to what we were saying before you know golden age of hip-hop was one thing there might be just we might have just come out of the golden age of djing and we might be heading in a new direction um it's always interesting to watch how change happens. I mean, as much as I complain about it and kind of sound like an old grumpy ass, you know, there, there's a new, there's always going to be something new. There's always going to be a new direction that music goes. There's always going to be a new direction that artistry goes into. And it's, it's tough to embrace it because we just go, no, this is the way it should be done. Where it's it's hard for me to look at something and go, oh, that's that's an interesting take because I instantly the the asshole of me wants to mock it when like I heard like this emo hip hop. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I just lived through this shit like 10 years ago, like when it came to rock music. Now that shit shifted over to hip hop. Yeah. (laughs) Well, for me, it's the. I'm here to watch a DJ, right? Like this is a DJ stream. Like this isn't a variety show, right? But yeah. like, so I log in and then it's like, it was just so overwhelming. I'm like, okay, I want to play music and like shout out fans or if someone tips me fine, like, yeah, you know, thanks for the donation, whatever. But like, I'm getting inundated with like, what do you want your viewers to do with your viewership points? And I'm like, huh? And they're like, oh, well, you know, for every 10 minutes that a viewer watches, they earn points and they can redeem it for something on your stream. I'm like, this isn't fucking subway. Like I'm not a punch card, dude. Like <laughs> the fuck. And then like I was on mailing list and I got some email about like, yeah, sign up for the service for $10 a month. And then if you have smart lights in your house, which I'm a nerd and have a shit ton, I'm like, your users can redeem points to change the lights in your house. So like you can be watching me DJ and because you watched for an hour and accumulated 500 E points or whatever the fuck I want to call them, you can change the colors of the lights in my bedroom. Like what? Like that's where I turn into straight up old dude. Like, no, like get off my fucking lawn. Like, no, like (laughs) I'm here to fucking play music. Like you're not here to fucking throw a disco in my house, you know? Plus I can't come up with a cool nickname for my fans, which I mean, there's like three of them anyway, but like (laughs) I can't, well probably two after today, but, um, I can't even like watching super famous DJs, like large signees to like big record, like agencies and shit like that, shouting out their, whatever their nickname for their fans are. I'm like, this is the corniest shit I've ever fucking seen in my life. Like I can't have, like, I get it. Beyonce has the beehive. You're not Beyonce. Yeah. Like I can't, 
I just it's the it's the lamest fucking thing ever. Like uh, the hashtag, but it's all it's part of a new game, you know. And uh, I just that's the reason why I'm at the end of my playing of the game because this isn't the the DJing is now the least important part about DJing. It's tough. Like it's it's fun. Like I I, I honestly like it was one of those. I just wanted to go online. And just be like, hey, I'm going to play some shit that I really like and hope, hopefully you guys dig it too. Yeah. And then it was, hey, do this, do that. I totally get what you're saying. Uh, and so I stopped looking at the chat. Yeah. Uh, and I, uh, half the time when I stream, I don't even announce it. Like I don't post it, post it on Facebook because for me, it's the therapy of playing music and playing and fucking around, having fun, working on stupid little, you know, routines and shit. Like I just dumb little ideas, but like, and obviously we want to make money, like, right? Like you're doing a podcast, you're trying to monetize it as you should, you're like DJ, like you're, everyone's becoming more entrepreneurial and that's a beautiful fucking thing. I'm a huge proponent of it. But at some point you stray so far from the middle of like what this is about, right? Mm-hmm. Like this is perfect for it. This is a podcast, right? This is, we're sitting down talking. There's no real formula. There's no, you know, lines that we need to stay within. Um, but like, when it comes to DJing and doing a music performance, it's like, I'm not going to go see Halsey and have her have a random like pop quiz in the middle of her show. <laughs> like, like it's not going to happen. Yeah. Or, like I'm not going to be at a concert and Halsey's going to be like, redeem your Halsey points, all you Halsey maniacs and change the state lights to green. Like, I don't know. It just, it seems so fucking gimmicky. And largely that is old dude. Me. Like I just, I miss, I miss where being a good DJ was what was first. And don't get me wrong. Like there's obviously like any industry, there's more to it than just knowing music and just playing music. But like at this point, there's so many DJs who can get on where their actual ability to do the craft is like the seventh best thing they're at. And that part frustrates me. Like we live in an era of getting your press kit and your photos done before you've ever played a fucking gig. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I go, I mean, cool that you have a friend with a camera and, you know, whatever, and putting out your press kits. Like, you dude, know. I still haven't had professional photos taken. Dude, every press kit that mentions the rave, I just want to comment on it. I'm like, how much did you pay to open? Because <laughs> every one of them, like, opened up for so and so. I'm like, yeah, you paid 400 bucks to open for them. There was a. <laughs> like, that's how the rave operates. It's pay to play, homie. Like, there was a, there was a point that I remember, um, uh, I don't give a fuck if I mention the artist. I won't. Men- I won't mention the. <laughs> yes, I love it. I officially got the wheels coming off. I'm like, ah, let let it fly. I uh, I won't mention the person because he's a good friend of mine still. Um, but he had hit me up and he worked at the rave at the time, and he's like, hey man, he goes, are you busy such and such night? And I go, yeah, I'm, I'm playing at a venue down the street, uh, but I start at ten. What's up? And he goes, are you interested in opening for, I think it was Young Thug and Migos. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, I kind of took a look at it and I was like, or I think it was like Young Dolph and Migos. Sure. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll, I'll do like a new new school hip hop set. Like, how long is it? They're like, they want you to play for 30, 40 minutes. I was like, perfect. I was like, I can shortcut a bunch of records, so on and so forth, go in and out of shit. And I'll just kind of plan the shit ahead of time as opposed to just what I typically do, hit the ground running. I was like, cool. I was like, yo, I was like, so you need me to play till X amount of time. I was like, here's what I need. I was like, I need equipment set up or I need to be able to get in and out as quick as possible because I have another gig to go to. Mm-hmm. And I go, and here's what I need as far as money goes. And I go, oh, uh, I I can't get you paid. And I was like, why would you come at me with this? And they were just like, well, you know, it's exposure, so on and so forth. Like, you'd be working with Migos. I'm like, i barely know who Migos are like I don't play any of their records I heard the song Versace when it first came out and it annoyed the fuck out of me that people requested it yeah I was like I'm not like no offense like if I'm not getting paid to do this I don't mean to be a dick don't waste my time I uh yeah uh, fuck it all right you shared yours I'll share mine so Go I was uh I was approached to do uh one of the festivals downtown during mm-hmm. uh, not summer fest but a different festival down there and they wanted me to do a Sunday shift and it was from it was like one to five on a Sunday and I met with the person in charge and they had connections to a bar I worked at. And so like we knew each other, we were definitely familiar with one another and they had reached out and like, Hey, like we're interested, you know, you want to do it? So sure. And they're like, well, can you come on down and have a meeting just so, cause like they didn't necessarily book a bunch of local DJs. This is 10 years plus ago. 
So I'm like, yeah, sure. So I go in and, you know, do the whole talk. And they're like, yeah, well, we kind of want like this 80s, 90s, like up tempo, just party thing, kind of like what you do at the Jackalope. Um, but we think it'll be great one through five or from like one to five on Sunday. And I'm like, cool. And they're like, uh, we don't have, you know, decks or anything. So you got to bring your own gear, which you kind of are used to if you're, if you've ever played Summerfest or anything similar, like you always got to bring your own shit. Yeah. Um, Cause we're not that big of superstars. Um, so, uh, I went and like, yeah, like that's not a problem. I can pack up my decks, whatever. And I'm like, so how does this work? They're like, well, um, you can park near the artist lot and it's only like 20 bucks. Um, we'll get you a ticket so that you can get in. But, uh, if any of your, like, if you want to bring people, they, we can get like a half price thing up front. You just got to tell us. And I was like, okay. And I get like, sometimes like they're splitting the gate with somebody else or whatever. And they're like super picky on that. So that part I wasn't worried about. And then I'm like, all right, so like, what are we looking at for finances on this? And they're like, oh, well, we're expecting you to do it in kind. No, I had worked in marketing for years, so I was well aware of the fact that in-kind means fucking for free. (laughs) So I'm like, you want me to come on a Sunday, play from one to five, bring all my own equipment, pay to park, lug my equipment through the fucking parking lot, which I can't carry two turntables and a mixer by myself, Yeah, and then pay for someone else to come in to carry my mixer to work for four hours and I'm like so are you guys like is it free to get in that day or something they're like well no it's regular price I'm like well are you donating the gate to like a charity maybe like is all the money going to some fun like well no and I'm like so you want me to work for free while you make money off me they're like well it's good exposure at this point I literally had six residencies I work six nights a week and I went I don't mean this arrogantly but what more I can't create like Sunday is my day. I don't work. Like I can't create another shift. No, that's not how this works. So like I chuckle cause I see a lot of people that do work for them. And when they like gas them, like, like and I get it. Like for some people, it's just a fun party to play, but yeah. like, like, People are talking about how I'm like, dude, you're the 19th person that asked that they asked, and you were the third one that said you would. Like, <laughs> like you didn't win a contest here. You were willing to work for free. Yeah. Like, and like I said, I have no problem. Like, we've done between the two of us a shit ton of charity stuff. Like, especially like Nate and the guys at Rogues. Like, I have Nate, no problem doing any Nate of and Amber. That. Right. Like, yeah. If it's something where we're raising money or coming together, like I've like Nate put together a fundraiser when I broke my leg. He's helped me out. Obviously, when James passed, you know, we put together that and diabetes, like all the other fundraisers. I have no problem donating my time if we're donating to a cause yeah but here you are coming at me as like a huge company downtown having this huge party and you're just like fucking deboing me like no dude like you're not getting paid like fuck off you mean my bike (laughs) yeah like oh so you you just want to like whore me out i'm a fucking commodity like nah man go suck a dick up till you hiccup i ain't fucking dealing with this shit yeah the uh i can never i could never get behind that and it's weird because it happens so much and i mean at the beginning of your career it makes sense to pay to play to get on like certain gigs and shit like that and to make those contacts it kind of makes sense but at some point like dude is that someone's car system yeah it's giving me flashbacks to working at cartoons i can't tell if that's below me behind me or outside well oh i was gonna say since we're on the fifth floor and it's a car system odds are it's gonna be below you parker because this isn't you know the jetsons we don't have flying cars no, no no i mean like i couldn't tell if that was like my neighbors downstairs i came through the windows that's okay that's which it happens from time to times and it's one of those that like kate and i have discussed like how bad it tastes music that my neighbors below me have where it's just constant chain smokers and i'm like you guys are fucking killing me. You have a DJ that lives above you and you're listening to this shit. Dude, how big was the check that Halsey cashed to do that fucking feature on Closer? Because like even when she does it live now, like she just does her verse and is out. Like she <laughs> won't even fuck with it. Like she knows how cornball the shit is. Like but more power to them. They're making fucking money. Um no, like the the work for free shit, I I get like you gotta cut your teeth. And I think there's definite the pay to play thing is viable, but I don't think it's necessary. And I think it's shitty because it's taking advantage of people. Right. Yeah. It's the same thing as, uh, yeah, fuck it. Um, when new DJs are like up and running, trying to get over like, Oh, I'll sell you my hard drive. Shit like that. Like that's fucking Bush league. Like a, I don't want you to have my hard drive B like, if you want to do this, do this. 
But like, if you're not willing to even put forth the fucking effort of getting your own music to DJ, you're going to, you're going to be out. Like the, you don't want to do this shit. So like, uh, there's better ways to get on than the pay to play thing. It's just, it's and bars. Love it. Cause there's, I mean, if you have been, if you're living at home, you're 21, 22 years old, you know, you're trying to figure out your life and you have next to no overhead, 75 bucks a night. Plus you get some free drinks and girls get to walk up and talk to you all night. That's a pretty fucking interesting take. Yeah. You know, you hit 30 and you got fucking car note and rent and bills and maybe kids and shit. Like you ain't leaving the house for 75 fucking dollars. Yeah. I but, remember those old days. They're weird to me still that like, I remember like some of my first gigs were like 50 bucks a night and like red you, get, you get six Coronas. <laughs> I didn't even get that. It was a, uh, I was my first, my first Friday residency was at the red room, which is now Fink's. Mm-hmm. Next to Bel Air, I and, know where that is. And, yeah, uh, old, across the street from Bel Air. Yeah, yeah. Was, yeah, sorry, across the street. Uh, old Man Malcolm was the bartender. Uh, old Man Malcolm, the DJ slash producer for Citizen King. Uh, for young folks, Citizen King is a band from Milwaukee. Yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> um, so Malcolm was. There's the bartender. no one under thirty watching. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Go watch Gone in sixty seconds. Their song was in it. Um, so I ended up like I knew Malcolm from the scene, and he had hit me up. And he was like, "Yeah, you're interested." So this is also pre Serato. So this is like 2000. 2006 um i did friday nights i had to bring two turntables mixer monitor <laughs> four crates of records i got 30 dollars and two drink tickets <laughs> and at 24 years old if you thought two drinks were gonna last me all night no prayer <laughs> so i would bring two turntables a mixer a monitor Four crates of records and spend 50 bucks <laughs> so that I could get drunk on Friday nights listening to music that I liked. <laughs> and like DJ Contact, Charles used to come out because I would do Neil Soul there. And I remember playing his like sweet back and shit on vinyl and like all this weird like Sade, Groove Theory vibe stuff. And it was cool for the small room, but like nobody, like if we had four people there, I felt like it was the biggest win ever. But like I literally would be upside down because I would like I was full fledged, like let's fuck it or age. So I'm sitting there crushing, you know, double talls. And like after two drinks, he's like, yeah, dude, I can't give you any more. I'm like, yeah, whatever. Keep the fucking meter running. Like <laughs> end of the night, I'm expecting an envelope. And they're like, yeah, you're like 5280. And I'm like, fuck <laughs> me. Like, this is not the brightest business decision I've ever fucking made. But it was, I mean, the memories I have of it are fucking fantastic. But that's how I cut my teeth. Like, and it's, you know, there's, everyone's got the, most DJs I know have a quarter story. Like, right, like, if you DJ at quarters, that was like your fucking training grounds. You know what? I've seen a ton of DJs play there. I don't think I ever played there. It's it hasn't been much. Uh, it's way less prevalent than it ever was. If it's still even around, but it still is. Yeah, yeah. You're going back. I mean, you're going back 15 years. Back when, like, I uh, I want to say at least a year or two before the like the pandemic kicked in, like there was a couple of friends that I knew that were doing like industrial shit mm-hmm. because you know my fucking taste for music goes all over the fucking board, and like I remember going in there and I was like, oh fuck yeah, dude! I was like. Like, I remember coming here, like, when I was 18 years old, 19 years old, and I was catching, like, punk shows and shit like that. And I never realized that there was a back area, like, they had a patio that was open now. Mm-hmm. I was like, holy shit, dude. I was like, this brought back so many memories. Like, I was there with a, a good friend, Kyle Krakowski, who I've been friends with since I was in middle school. And, like, we always had the same taste in music. Like, I remember, like, I would I would hear stuff, and I, I'd be like, oh, like, I'm listening to this. And he'd be like, oh, you think that's cool? He's like, check this out. Like, I remember being like, I'm listening to Gravity Kills, like, before, like, Guilty, like, ever came out. And he'd be like, oh, you think that's cool? These guys are on the same label. This is KMFDM, or this is Ministry, or God. this is this is Nine Inch Nails, and this new artist that they just signed, Marilyn Manson's playing on this track. And he would have the story about how, like, they rented out the tape house and, like, did a six-track EP and shit like that. Like... That was always the crazy shit to me. Where the fuck was I going with this? Where, uh, what's the weirdest, like, local, you don't have to necessarily name names, but, like, weirdest venue that you, like, won off that you're like, yeah, that was not what I expected. Huh. Or I can go first and you can ponder. I'm trying to think. Like, I didn't do, like, a one-off. Like, I've always, like, I always like to say that I'm pretty proud of the fact that almost anywhere I've played, I've always been invited back. Um, <laughs> shout out to just shitting on everybody else who fucking did a one off. Parker's like, oh, I'm too good for that. Like, they wouldn't cancel me. I've done many a one off, motherfucker. Um, well, mine was Timbuktu. 
I did Club Timbuktu on Center Street in River West. Is that across the street from Mad Planet? Yeah. Okay, I know where that is. So yeah. I played there with uh, Milkman and Optimist mm-hmm. um, for a Valentine's Day show, like 13. 13- years ago or so um but it was, it was a standard it was like a, i think it was like a thursday night it was just a one-off and they're like do you want to come in and play r&b shit and i'm like bet and like i i had never been there i always kicked it uh at anopa i saw so many fucking hip-hop shows at anopa it was ridiculous so like i knew the neighborhood and it was like cool vibes i'm like bet so i go in and like i forgot who was going on i think mike might have been spinning up front and i was just sitting at the bar drinking with the bartender and then i had somebody hanging out with me whatever <laughs> and a uh, standard Milwaukee form, like drop 20 on the bar. They put your change there, whatever, buy another drink. They just take it out of your pile. And I'm sitting there and I must've turned to like talk to somebody. And some homeless dude came in and snatched my like $4 off the bar and fucking hit it. <laughs> like sprinting out the front door. So the owner dude, at least I think it was the owner at the time, like grabs a fucking machete. <laughs> yeah. Like not fucking around from behind the bar and goes down the street holy shit chasing after this dude and like dude came back and he like came up to me and he was like you know i'm sorry i don't put up with that disrespect in my place i'm like i don't know what the fuck to say like this dude like hardcore like went behind the bar like pulled four dollars out of the register and like i'm like dude you can just keep the four dollars like, <laughs> you got a fucking machete bro like you win like that, please don't kill that guy. right if the crackhead needed like let him have his four dollars like <laughs> I don't, like dude that dude scared the shit out of me i mean super fun time it was really cool um but like i was freaked the fuck out dude like just reached over the bar like you pictured like your standard like what normally would be like the south side bar owner has got like a snub nose 38 under the register nope this dude had a fucking full-grown like machete from the serengeti just yanked that shit from behind the bar and he was like yep let's dance motherfucker and i'm like i think you win i i can two things come to mind um there was a venue that used to be rain and it later became social live (laughs) and i think they only had like one deck and so i had to go run home and like i have like five decks under here yeah a couple old mixers i like i pulled one out went back set it up and then like kind of did the outline for like what my opening set was going to be and i think it was one of those like they tried to negotiate with me because they weren't busy (laughs) <laughs> like what they wanted to pay me. And I was like, Hey, we agreed to this. I showed up. You didn't have the equipment you promised to have. In fact, that's mine. and I'm taking it with me. And I, I, I think I said to whoever was paying me, I go, and that one's about to be mine. If you don't fucking pay me. Yeah. And they were just like, all, all right, we'll, we'll make it happen. Like we might have to pull some money out of the register. I'm like, I don't give a fuck, dude. Yeah. Like I'm like, I'm Mexican as fuck. Like I will steal shit if you don't pay me. <laughs> Like, you like those rims on your car? <laughs> Let the record reflect the views and opinions of Parker DJ Zero Cool. Do not reflect the views and opinions. Like, let me say, I was a Mexican. Uh, um, yeah, that, uh, yeah, especially if it was the mom, I bet you would have had a fun time in that situation. Um, <laughs> it's just, uh, yeah, some of these veggies, man, like the shit, the shit they think they can get away with, like, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, there's a lot of chucklehead fucking DJs that don't take this shit seriously. You know, like we always talk about the amount of drinking we did, but like at the end of the day, we still got the job done. Yeah. Like most of the venues I've ever played at, drinking was an issue if it was an issue. Like if you could drink and still deliver, they didn't care. Plus, let's face it, half the venues love it that we were hardcore drinkers because people buy you shots. Like I literally had a bartender at one point bar manager i should say possibly an owner i'm trying to be vague on purpose um (laughs) who i wasn't feeling well and i wasn't drinking for like a week heaven fucking forbid i take a week off of killing myself you know and i wasn't drinking i was just drinking water so i was turning down shots and they're like what are you doing i'm like i don't fucking feel dude like you can feel my liver like it's glowing like (laughs) i've been a fucking hardcore lust for the last 10 years five nights a week like Every now and again, you got to take a day off. And they're like, well, you know how much money that costs us? I'm like, what? They're like, well, but like, you know, that's an easy extra 50 to 100 bucks of people buying shots for you. And it, I think that was like one of my first moments where I was like, 
Am I a hoe? <laughs> fuck. Well, no, but it's just like, fuck all you motherfuckers. Like, you guys all act like we're BFF, right? Like, you guys all want to be my best friend, like, all that shit when I'm making money for you. But, like, I am so disposable to you. It's not even fucking funny. Like, that was when I kind of shifted my whole focus on the industry where I'm like, don't get me wrong. I love the people I've worked with. I'm fortunate to have worked with so many of them, and a lot of them are really good people. But there's a whole lot of them that smile on your face and act like you're fucking really good friends. And the second that you don't make a penny for them, they don't give a fuck about you. Yeah. Like, they don't give a shit. They, like, you were a means to an end. And now that you're not, you're disposable. Yeah. And, like, that's the part about this industry that, like, is really hard. And I definitely didn't get when I was younger. Like, being able to, like, draw that line between, like, no, you know what? You don't own me. Like, I can play the same shitty music at another shitty bar down the street that sells the same shitty Miller Lite for three fifty. Like, and as I get older, that's actually one of the things that I like. I'm kind of excited about starting over because I'm like fine tuning where I'm going to be working and like who I'm going to be working with, and not just because for so long you get so excited as a DJ where you're like, you know, somebody calls and he's like, "Hey, we got a gig for you." you want and you just take everything, right? You're just yeah, because like, you don't never know when your last gig's going to be. So you just jump at everything that gets fucking thrown at you as long as the money's right. And then you end up working for like, I mean, we both work for some real fucking winners, but like, yeah. you know, you end up in these situations where like, like, nah, this just isn't it. Like, it's not worth it. Like 300 bucks a week isn't, no, fuck you. Like I, I'd rather find another way to make 300 bucks a week. Like, yeah, and it's, it's tough, you know, especially when the fact like there's a new venue that asks and you're like, oh, I kind of want to play there, so on and so forth. We, you and I went to a meeting with one of them. Yeah. And we both sat there and we're like, I, actually, I remember that clear as day because you were, you had the in with the the one guys. Yeah. I knew the other guy. And then we went in for the meeting. They did their spiel. You and I walked out. And I don't think we were two steps out of the door for both of us looked at each other. And you were like, yeah, fuck this shit. Like, yeah. Nope. Um, But it's it's interesting, man. Like, I, I love... I love playing new places. I like what I like is this is I like the fact that where I play or where I've played, like the places I call my, my home are diverse. Like I have a place where if I want to go full nightclub mode, I can do that. If I want to go loungy, I can do that there. If I want to play to a bunch of drunken college kids, I can go there. Like, it was nice to be able to have that balance where it was like, I'm not in one category. Like I can do, like if I get sick of doing this, I just go, Hey, I'm going to take a month off and they go, okay, cool. Uh, just call us when you want to do dates again. Cool. I just want to do this. Like one of the things I, I, and I'll, I'll toot my horn about them as much as I want, I guess. Um, Taylor's has always been like one of my favorite spots. And it was because of the fact that like, I remember going there and it was like one of the first places that was just like wheeling play house here. And I was like, I was such a house head at the time that I was like, this is my home. Like when I was playing like rabbit in the moon shit and like just like crazy Euro like EDM shit. Which would have gone over huge there, I'm sure. Um, Like everyone, lo- like I wouldn't say that everyone loved it. It was one of those that they're like, dude, you have amazing taste in music. And then eventually it got to the point that like, I remember like looking around the room and I was like, nobody is into this. <laughs> and like, I remember I, I had the conversation with, uh, with Jimmy and his brother and I was like, Hey, I go, if this doesn't work, I go, oh, you don't have to pay me, but I'm pretty sure that everything that you guys are doing, no one, no one cares what's being played. Like no one's having fun. Like no one's kind of going along. Like this is just background noise for people that are drinking. Mm hmm. And uh, they're like, well, what do you want to do? I was like, I just want to do anything but what we're doing right now. And I go, if I'm wrong, so be it. And it was like one of their busiest weekends. It was like Bastille days. And they're like, okay, give it a shot. And then like immediately like the crowd like went to the bar staff and was like, this is amazing. Like, who is this? Like, is this something you guys are doing on a regular basis? And they were like, there was such a great reaction to it that literally changed the direction that they were going. Yeah. Fuck you for that, by the way. Cause I played that room two years before you did. (laughs) And I was given the same fucking speech, like from Nick. (laughs) I did Carrie's graduation party when Carrie was bartending. Yeah. I did her college graduation party and it was basically a Taylor's fucking party. So I, and it's not on Nick by any stretch, but Nick reached out to me. He was like, dude, we want you to come in. So I did one fucking Friday night. Like I took off from Jackalope, mm-hmm. walked in. I couldn't get their CDJs and their eight 
fucking pioneer 800 to work so i was literally running one deck and they were like just do what you did at carrie's party awesome so i'm playing dance hall i'm playing 80s i'm playing all this <laughs> and uh is it jimmy or dan who's the both they're brothers okay well one of them came up literally looked at me wouldn't even speak to me went back down went over to nick said something and then nick came up he's like yeah can you, you have to stop playing what you're playing i think i was playing like stevie b or some shit right and like that room's an older room it's yeah. not 21 year olds so I'm like dude all these like 42 year old cougars are going fucking ham right now like they remember getting finger banged in fucking high school to this shit <laughs> like what the fuck and they're like you have to play house music and it's like 10 17 p.m and i'm going well, I've got like 12 house records, so <laughs> how many times can I play Robin S. Show Me Love on fucking repeat? Like, that's why I, you and Dion, both of you, I was always so fucking pissed because I loved that room. I got my one shot, and then they were like, Ixnay on the ombre. Like, I was not, like, I was barely allowed to even come back and drink. They hated what I played so much there. And then, like, fast forward six months, Dion, was just Dion's, Dion, dude's fucking amazing, but like, Dion was I walked in and he was playing the roots and I was like what the fuck like he's playing the seed by the roots and no one's yelling and screaming I'm like this is horseshit and then I come in and see you and I'm like man fuck both these dudes. Like, <laughs> like this is the shit I wanted to play and I had a fucking black like I love that room the people are always really good yeah and so on and so forth but I was always like super butthurt that I was like you you know like what I play like you liked it at the party but it wasn't Nick them it was the owners who had yeah. you know they always had a pretty straight vision of exactly what they wanted that room to be so when yes saw you guys you know breaking the norm and turning that room into what it could be I was like oh my friends are way better at this than I am this is sad it became, I mean it became a really fun party like and it was it was weird because you would have and, and you still have that really diverse crowd where it's you know, thirty per, you know thirty and up professionals, and then <clears throat> forty fifty year olds hanging out. You know, they're always there every Friday and Saturday having their drinks, and then all of a sudden yeah, they're like, just doing blow in the bathroom, trying to bang twenty year old fucking euro chicks. That's that's really what it is. And then you have like a group of bachelor, like like twenty bachelorettes that come in like off of a bus, and you're like, how? Like, why did you guys pick this place? Like, I, huh? And they like come in. They're like, "We need to hear Bieber. We need to hear this." And it's like, <laughs> "Fucking hell! Please just have your two drinks and get the fuck out already." <laughs> Please stumble into whatever the fuck you're going to next. That reminds me of So Seven with Bobby when we opened that spot because you like, oh, "Hey, this is an ultra lounge, and we want this to be like the cool upscale lounge." All right, what do you want musically? Oh, eighties and nineties. Like we're spending all this money to make this like chic lounge and you want me to play like eighties cock rock. Like, yep. And I'll never forget him coming up to me. Like <laughs> shortly after that, like we did New Year's and it was fucking nuts. Everybody's just doing ecstasy. Fucking the amount of water they sold at seven dollars a bottle that night <laughs> to slightly older than us European men just rolling off their fucking asses, sweating their balls off is fucking great. But we were I remember being there in like January or February, busy ass night, lying around the block, and then Bobby coming up to me going, like, I need you to like get it going in here. I'm like, There's a line around the fucking block. Well, yeah, but I need you to like get it up tempo. I'm like, you can't fit more people in your bar. <laughs> what what and so then the second I'd play like, you know, I'd try to play like a DMX record or something, like, no, 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 none of that rap shit. And like Dude, you're fucking killing me, Smalls. Like the 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 view. I'm always impressed by the people who own bars and run bars. There seems to be a disconnect from when they worked at bars. Like they understood shit when they worked at a bar. They got the game, and yeah. for whatever reason, when they bought it, all the shit that they knew just goes out the fucking window when it comes to like programming musically. Like all of a sudden, they're just like, "You can't play this. No one's gonna be into it." Like you haven't listened to music in ten years. Like shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like you hired me. Like you hired me because of what I do. Like give me a little wiggle room. And like and obviously like nobody ever wants to talk about how incredibly racist the bars are in Milwaukee and musically and all that shit. But it would be funny because these bars, you know, with their like over the top music shit, like you can't play that. Like we don't want rap music. We don't want this. And I'm like, what are you afraid of? 
like and I get that everybody was like oh you know racist dress codes and they're trying to scare away minorities and I'm like the problem you don't understand is the person who most wants to hear that rap record is the 21 year old white girl that you spend all of your advertising dollars trying to get in here the minority you're trying to shun away is used to it because he gets treated like shit at every bar he goes to anyway because nobody will fucking play the music that they want to hear. Yeah. So, like, they're used to being abused. They'll stay here because that's how shitty our city is. They're not going to fucking leave because any other bar they go to, they're not going to hear the music they want to hear. They're going to hear the same watered-down pop bullshit that every other bar in this neighborhood wants to play. So it was always, like, it would drive me nuts at these places. Like, dude, like, no one's going to, like, you're not going to lose your shit if you hear one fucking rap record. Like, is, but some bars, I, there was a very popular place downtown that is, is still a very popular place. And I filled in for 20 minutes while somebody went to the bathroom and I played young MC bust a move and the GM slash part owner came up and goes, why are you playing this rap shit? And I'm like, Hey, the song is 25 fucking 30 years old at this point. Yeah. B when was the last time somebody threw a punch to young MC? No shit. Like easy, but like the disconnect between these bar owners, and I get it, like they have a lot on their plate. But like if you're gonna be if you're gonna be that hardline on the music, then either A, just put in a fucking jukebox and program yourself, or B, like, you know, build your own Apple playlist and fucking play it, whatever you're gonna do. But like or at least know something about music. But like when the last time you listened to music was in 2002, I get it. Like a lot of people hit an age. I'm the same way. Like yeah. more often than not, if I'm listening to music in the car, I go back to what I know and what's familiar. Like I'll throw on my nineties Pandora station, you know, shit like that. Like I get the comfort level, but like we're here to make money. And the last time I checked, the only color that anybody cared about when making money was green. green. <laughs> Like, I don't give a fuck. Yes, as DJs, do you have to work off stereotypes? Absolutely. But those stereotypes apply way more to people our age than they do younger. Like, I was joking. I was talking to a manager at a bar a couple months ago. And the conversation was about people being open to different styles of music. And I joked that, like, playing, like, 90s rock in front of people that weren't white that were our age always felt like flat, mm-hmm. like playing Nirvana in front of like a 41 year old black dude. And more times than I would be like, yeah, no, like I, this isn't my thing. But the generation younger than us, <laughs> the ones that are in between their twenties and thirties grew up listening to all the different genres of music. That's why I loved like at RWB, like I could play the, like the shitty pop punk stuff, your blink One Eighty Two stuff like that. But it was universally accepted. There was such a change because people our age, it was like, nope, like you stay in your lane. Like you play this or you play this. If you crossed over, like people would just stare at you fucking wild. Yeah, that was weird. Like in the early 2000s and the late 90s, if you were a hip hop DJ, you were a hip hop DJ. If you were a house DJ, you were a house DJ. And you dare not step over that line because it was for whatever reason, like it would always you were shunned. Like it was one of those that like, wait. You drop party at, like if you were like the DJ at like I don't know, uh, what was it Eve? Mm-hmm. Like you had to play house all night. Oh yeah, and then all of a sudden you dropped DMX party up in the middle of your set. Why would you do something like that? Well, just for changing shit up. Like no one gave a shit. Like it was just to push the party. Like whatever. And mm-hmm. it was just like, but you played hip hop you're a house DJ. Like it was, it, it was never one of those that you could go outside of that realm where now it's, if you only do hip hop, you only do house. It's what the fuck's wrong with you? Well, for so long, everybody took their cue from Vegas. Right. Yeah. So like all the DJs in Vegas, I remember once we, like when you and I were doing like the more big room club shit, everybody in Vegas was house for a while right it was strictly edm everywhere even the big name djs that were getting signed on to do residencies all they banged out were 128 bpm remixes of shit right your your vice your guys like that Mm -hmm. and then am blows up playing at the palms all over whatever his whole shit's going nuts and then open format became popular and i remember having a lot of the DJs, like the scam guys coming into town, even when, like I was playing at 720 and Kennedy's, like a lot of times they'd come over to Kennedy's before they'd go on at 720 just to see like the vibe in Milwaukee or whatever to catch because at 720 they always just had like an opening CD or whatever. 
until midnight because nobody got there before midnight. Mm-hmm. And then, um, so at Kennedy's, we were always pretty busy 10 to 12 and then we'd thin out. So like I'd be over there just doing open room, open format, weird shit. And I'd end up rapping with a lot of these guys and they were like, this is different. I'm like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, like nobody plays this style of shit. Milwaukee's known for it. Like in DJ communities is being like this weird, like asterisk on the map. Cause like, to be successful in the city, you have to know music. You have to be able to reach. Like, obviously there's a, a fair amount of venues that are like, obviously very targeted, you know, like we want 21 year old college kids, like got it, you know, but to like play anything different than that, like you have to be able to d- get into your bag. You have to be able to play some nineties. You have to know some rock. You have to know a ha- like handful of country records, but these DJs that were coming from Vegas were like, this shit's fucking cool. You know, like we don't get to do this shit elsewhere. You like play a dance hall record at fucking midnight at peak hour and then go into some EDM shit and like bounce all over. Like they were really enjoying it. So then I smiled because shortly after that, everything in Vegas was open format DJs. That's all you fucking heard about, yeah. you know? Like the Sundays that, that AM and Steve Aoki used to do were just insane. Like it was one of those that it, it's like I said, like, they went all over the fucking board. And especially with Steve Aoki at the time. I don't know how to respond to that. Damn, Damn Siri. Just want to chime in and shit. I, whew, uh, yeah, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> everything everything I was going to say was going to turn into a hashtag fucking boycott Eric moment on fucking social media. So like, fucking woman, shut up. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, no, those dudes, uh, the the fucking do over yeah well in the do over in la like parties like that that were wide open format where you'd get jazzy jeff who got done doing a club set or you'd get you know so many of these big name touring dudes neil armstrong guys like that like they'd be in la on a saturday night playing whatever club and at sundays they'd be at this little fucking restaurant out back jamming soul records yeah the crowd just going nuts like that and it sucks because that's like my Al Bundy moment where I'm like, God damn it, I miss, you know, those the glory days. Like, that was one of my favorite descriptions when you and I got pitched. Um, uh, well, actually, it doesn't even fucking matter at this point. Like when McGillicuddy uh, and Joe Conforti pitched Sundays to us, mm-hmm. he was like, I want I want to have like the do over in yeah. L.A. But he's like, I want like you, Eric, YB. And I was like, say no more. I was like, I'm in. And, and it was just one of those things, like, as soon as he described it to me, I knew what he was talking about. And I was like, hell yeah. I was like, I want to go all over the board. I want to play different shit. And I want everything just like, just a little kicker. Like, just, you know, kicking back, having some fun, playing some playing some new, playing some old, and having fun with it. And that was some of my favorite times was doing those Sundays. Was Yeah, yeah. yeah fuck it. Yeah, yeah I, I absolutely loved the idea of that. But that was another situation where everybody was all I, I have a very skewed opinion of this because when when Nate started the bangerang he and I had known each other for a few months he wanted to do this rock rap party cut up he hit up first cut up did uh we were gonna rotate at first like cut up did one and then I was gonna do one and then we were gonna switch back and forth so like cut up did the first one I did the second one and I think on the third one we just started doing them together um but the problem with so many venues is that they're not willing to let a night grow, right? You have to like, and even then it was less social media dependent, but like now everything's so social media dependent. So like when Nate started that night and we like got behind it, the first nine months that we did that party, I mean, we probably had 500 people total, like across nine months that came out to see us. Mm-hmm. Right. But that was one of the reasons why I always loved the wicked hops. Cause they gave us the chance to like build, build, right. Yeah. We have nothing. And we make enough money, so, like, if we're not, as long as we're not hemorrhaging, you know, and it's not like we were, I mean, I was making, like, I think we're getting paid 150 bucks to DJ or 200 bucks to DJ. So, like, they made that in half an hour lunch shift, you know, like, they didn't, they weren't too worried about it. But, like, they let it grow, and then all of a sudden, oh, shit, this turned into, like, the busiest fucking party on a Monday for, you know, the better part of a decade. Um, That was the problem I had with those Sundays. And, uh, even after we had our initial pitch, it got pitched again later, uh, with another DJ who wanted to do the same thing. And it was cool. And I was always like, yeah, let's do it. And I'd show up to do my guest spot. And then I would do the open format shit. Cause the whole thing was, we don't want it like a normal club night. Yeah. 
But then the second they don't do $16,000 in Jameson shots because you're not banging out top 40, then they're like, what are you doing? Like, well, you can't have it both ways, dude. You can't tell me to like be musical and like do different shit and then be surprised when the people that come here who've been hearing the same shit every fucking night are a little off kilter about it. Yeah. Like you're not going to change the culture if you just go back to keep doing the same fucking thing, you know, like you want to have this, you know, musically dexterous and diverse, uh, music. But like, if we're just going to walk up there and bang out top 40 records, I'm good. Like, and that was the problem with a lot of those Sundays. And that's why I used to always get super frustrated. That's why I always demanded to open. I was like, I'll do any Sunday you want. As long as I can play the five o'clock shift, mm-hmm. as long as I can open and set it, that's fine. Cause then I can get away with playing. I'm a firm believer that if you're on a patio, the sun is out and it is nice outside. You have to play Frankie Beverly before I let you go. It is a <laughs> God mandated law it is the greatest patio song of all time. It is impossible to be upset when you're listening to it. Um, if you don't have it available, outstanding by the gap band is also acceptable, but like that's the type, like if I'm on a patio and I'm drinking and I'm relaxing, like I'm not trying to like be the super hype beast. Like, you know, last thing I want to hear is, you know, this 130 BPM bang, bang. It's like five o'clock and fucking sunny out on Sunday. Like it's the Lord's day. Yeah. Fucking sit back and relax a little bit. Like let's vibe a little bit. You know, I wanted to say that we, we started rebuilding something like that when, uh, when the iron horse started doing their, their patio Sundays, like the outdoor <laughs> ones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You did. Uh, I, I did one of those and then, um, I think I played a little more Parliament funkadelic stuff than they wanted. Um, Dude, how can you be mad at G Funk, man? I I followed what I was told to do, and the people that were there seemed to enjoy it. However, <laughs> <laughs> immediately after that, it was like we're gonna go in a different direction because that was the thing. Is I was playing literally all it was all seventies black R and B and soul music mm-hmm. and sixties shit. So I was playing you know Sam Cooke and fucking all this like fun music. That's the point though. Is like and everything doesn't need to be something you know every word to. You're selling food. I'm yeah. literally background music. Like I'm not the draw. I mean, in don't get me wrong. In the back of my mind, I like to think I'm the draw. But your food is the draw. People are here to eat their food. I'm just to add on to that. Like, I am the extra seasoning you put on it, but it was already good to begin with. Like, but they would, like, I just, uh, I could go on for days about, like, overthinking these nights and the way these fucking people that do bookings and shit, they're like, the other problem is they never go anywhere else. What do you mean? So a lot of the people, yeah, fuck it. I'm going to lose every gig I got anyway. Um, So a lot. A lot of owner operators and booking managers and shit like that, they work a lot, obviously, right? That's why they're successful. That's where they are. But they don't know necessarily what's going on in other spots. They know their small little fucking circle, right? Be it Brady, be it Third Ward, be it Water Street, right? Like Mm -hmm. the same, you go to the same six fucking places and they know that. But you know what works and you work because like as DJs, we travel, right? So I'll do one night in the third ward. I'll do one night downtown, you know, Bayview, kind of all over. And every different part's got a different vibe. Yeah. But these owner operators get this like vision in their head of what they picture how everywhere else is. And you're like, no, that's just your place. Like this is what you've cultivated here, but that's not necessarily the way it is elsewhere Mm -hmm. so that was the part that would get super frustrating because you play at these other spots and you're like i know what the fuck i'm doing like i'm not some fresh-faced kid like i've been doing this shit for years these people like just stick with it stick with it but it's like such a quick switch that they want to flip every time like you know don't play this don't play this play this don't play this like dude you hired me to do a job you know what that you know what that usually boils down to that's someone that's getting in their ear that they're tight with and they're like i'm not having fun and they assume that's the rest of the room which isn't always the case typically if your best friend is the nightclub owner manager venue owner venue manager manager whatever you're probably a douche and you're probably hanging out for social clout more than anything and if you're the type of person that hates on a roots record being played early you probably hate all music to begin with yeah, I mean, it's and very- you want you want to hear the same ten songs. You're literally that person whose Spotify 
is the person that listens to a billion Bieber fucking songs. Yeah, I mean, and people don't make requests if they're having fun, right? Yeah. People, people only request if they don't like what's going on. But no, it was just, and I get that from the crowd, right? The crowd doesn't need to be smart. They don't need to. They're there to spend money. They're the only reason we're open, right? And the bar's not there to sell music. It's there to sell beer. Mm-hmm. So whatever I can do to sell more beer is what I'm there to do. But like they, so many times you talk to the, like the bar owners and managers and shit, and you're like, do you go anywhere else? And I get a lot of them can't, right? Because they spend five and six nights a week doing this shit when they get their night off. The last thing they want to do is go to another fucking busy bar and hear another fucking DJ play another remix or hit their fucking shout out button or an air horn. Like, I totally get that. But like, there's such this closed mindedness of so many of these bars where it's like, they don't know shit about music and you feel bad, but you're like, okay, well you hired me because you think I'm a professional. Yeah. Like, give me a little bit of fucking rope here. Like, I obviously haven't been doing this for, and I don't care if you've been doing it 20 years or you've been doing it for five years. Like if you're able to do this shit for a living, right? Like this is what you do. You can't be that bad. Like, I know we make fun of certain DJs, but like you, yeah. you can't be that fucking bad. Like if you can make a living doing this, you have to be doing something right enough. Cause eventually people will stop booking you. So like, if you hired me to do a job, let me do my fucking job. Like, you, you, you have your Coke guy, Coca-Cola, not Coke. That's the other guy. But like your Coca-Cola guy that comes in to like fix your fucking lines. You don't tell him how to do it. Yeah. Like let him fucking fix the lines. Let me do the music. Is there going to be an occasional record that falls flat? Yeah, it happens. Every now and again, your fucking keg pops and your customer has a bad experience because their beer wasn't ready or it was flat or it, you know, or half these motherfuckers that don't clean their lines and the shit smells like ass. <laughs> And that's why everybody was pissed when the cigarette ban went into effect because they actually had to clean their fucking bars because <laughs> all the cigarette smoke covered up all the mold smell. But, um, but no, that, that like that shit is so fucking frustrating with these spots because they're like, we hired you because we want you to do what you do, but don't do that. I think it's, you know, I I had this notion not too long ago where it was I was it pertained to something else. Um, I think what some venue like booking agent, whoever the the person is just doing the booking, sometimes have this envision of everything going perfect because of the fact that whether it's you, whether it's YB, whether it's King James, whether it's myself, whoever the fuck it is, mm-hmm. um, they expect it to go absolutely perfect. I kind of have the mindset where I'm like, hey man, like if you're not perfect, don't expect me to be perfect either. Like some stuff's <laughs> gonna work. Some stuff's not going to work. It's organized chaos. Exactly. That's all the fuck it is. It's, it's organized chaos. It's as Diamond Dave said it best. It's we're hitting the ground running. Yeah. Uh, and and that's always been my philosophy is that like I, I'm going to come in. I don't like for me. I don't like planning out what I'm going to do. I, I like have an idea of like new records I want to try out early. Mm-hmm. And then eventually like I kind of want to move into something else like as it gets busier. But like it's one of those where. I like the idea that it's everything's on the go. Nothing's pre-planned. Like I remember having a conversation with a, with a promoter where he was like, he's like, yeah, well, you know that, that DJ plays the same set every time they go on stage at a festival. I'm like, that sounds like death, man. I'm like, I would never do that. And he goes, and he goes even further. He goes, well, if they were paying you, you know, $10,000 a night, you still wouldn't do it. I was like, fuck no. It, fuck no. I was like, that sounds horrible to me. Having to play the exact same thing, having to get excited about the same fucking records, the same transition every time, that sounds horrible to me. And it just sounds like utter death. I, I, I'd rather quit DJing than having to do that. I like the idea that it's you're standing on the edge of the building and it's fucking windy and you don't know what the fuck's going to happen. And it's just an adventure. But having to do the same thing over and over again no, not for me. Yeah, for ten grand a night, I get over it real fucking quick. Because <laughs> you know what you can buy with ten grand? A fucking wave runner. You know, what you've never seen somebody upset on on a fucking wave runner. And yes, I stole that joke from somebody else. But like, no, it, there's um, the easiest way to describe it is there is a much wiser than me gentleman named Ralph Davis who I worked with in radio. Uh, he's about twenty or thirty years older than me. Thirty years older than me um, from the south. Awesome dude. Sold Levi's in the most racist fucking county in fucking Georgia in the 60s. And like, dude, dude, in that 60s. Jesus Christ, not that old. Um, But like, dealt with some shit. He was an awesome salesman. Nicest guy I ever met. 
And his one thing he taught me in radio, he goes, my ability to put up with bullshit is directly proportionate with my income level. And I've always agreed with that. And it's worked as like the gigs where if I do a wedding, I charge them three grand. I never have a fucking problem. When I was starting out weddings and I was doing them for like 800 bucks, it was a constant fucking problem. It's the same thing with nightclub gigs. The gigs that pay me, you know, we got 150 bucks, we got 200 bucks. They're the ones that are in your ear every fucking second. The people are like, yeah, 400 bucks, 500 bucks, no problem. They never care. Like, it goes to all of that. Like, it's always the same thing. It's these people are like micromanaging this shit. Like, yeah. No. And like, yeah, I get not wanting to do the same songs and shit like that like that obviously gets terribly boring um but like i don't know it just it's it's there there's a fine line to walk there of like being creative and that's where i've often fought a little bit with djs because i'm like do what makes the crowd money they're like what makes the crowd spend money but like have a little bit of artistic integrity. Like, uh, yeah, I'm not going to sit there and replay the song four times a night. Like I won't do that. Like I, I have very odd rules of like what I consider, like this is like, I will not cross the line. Like if I played the peak record, I played the peak record. We don't go back and redo it. Like, yeah. sorry, you should have been here, you know, get over yourself. You can listen to it in the car. Like, sorry. It's so weird for that too, where it's like, well, can you play it again? Like I've had the same rule where I'm like, I don't play records twice. Like no. I have, I've, a two terabyte hard drive and a one terabyte hard drive that runs my operating system. Like I have a shit ton of music on those two drives. Like I have a lot of records I can play. Like Mm -hmm. there's more shit out there than whatever the fucking Cardi B record is right now. Well, and it's not that serious. Like it's always the people that you see five nights a week anyway. Like you're literally going to hear this in 20 minutes at the next bar you go to, or you're going to hear it at two 15 when you're in the drive through at Oakland Euros or Euro palace or whatever in yeah. your car. And then you're going to hear it when you you're shout to Euro palace or <sighs> the fucking Euro palace right down the street. Dude, this is the one thing I miss about being a full fledged alcoholic working every night. <laughs> the drunk wake up your whole fucking apartment smells like Euro and regret. Oh my God. I've had some. I've I've farted away some of the worst stomach aches because of that place. I knew a buddy who almost got divorced because he would come home after going out drinking with me, and we would stop at the OG Euro Palace on Twenty Seventh Street because he lived in Greendale, mm-hmm. and uh, I think Greendale's down there, Glendale, Greendale, I don't know, somewhere on the south side. But Greendale, yeah, yeah. I would drop him off at like bar clothes, and his wife would be asleep, and he'd have a fucking Euro, and he'd smash as much as he could in the like kitchen, and then wouldn't throw it out. So it'd be like simmering Euro mass on the kitchen counter and his wife would wake up at like eight in the morning. Yeah. We, we stopped hanging out and we weren't, <laughs> we weren't allowed to go drinking anymore together because of the, the Euro funk. But you, you might have it a little bit better than me. Like I had friends of mine that were married in significant relationships that weren't allowed to hang out with me. Like I remember, you remember Jorge, right? I remember when Jorge got engaged, I was like, yo dude, I was like bachelor party. I gotta go play out in Vegas. I was like, you have one of two choices. You can come with me to Vegas I was like, you can party with me for the for like a couple of days while I DJ and we'll we'll do we'll do everything. We'll, mm-hmm. we'll do zip lines. We'll gamble. We'll hang out for a couple of days afterwards, and we'll just party, whatever. I was like, or we're going to Mexico and we're really fucking shit up. <laughs> Donkey and he, show. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, all right, let me run past my my girl. <laughs> Comes back and he goes, I'm not allowed to leave the state with you. And I was like, are you fucking serious? He's like, he's like, dude. He's like it'll end my fucking marriage. And I was like, son of a bitch, dude. But that yeah. was, that was a story from so many of my married or like significant friends. that had significant others. Yeah. We, yeah, I've got a couple of homies. Uh, I had a buddy's wedding that, uh, I was shunned into being like, I went from being actual groomsman to after the like bachelor party, I was, uh, relegated to like usher status. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, Bitch, I just spent fifteen hundred dollars on this tuxedo and all this other shit, and now I'm a fucking usher. <laughs> like, I'm not even. I'm in two pictures. I'm like, fuck, I need a tuxedo for. I was so pissed. Like, oh, fucking horrible. He's still with her, but fucking horrible human being. <laughs> like, whatever. God doesn't love you. Oh, you know what? I remember I was going to circle back to. Uh, we were talking about like most awkward gigs before. Yes. I I, re- I don't know if you've ever done this. I remember the one gig I've ever walked out of. And I remember exactly what it was for. Have you ever walked out? I No, I can't. No, I'm way too cheap. I, there's no way I would have ever left without money. 
I uh, I'll, I'll share mine. I lost my mind. It was when uh, yeah, I'm thinking. I just, I don't think so. Can't was it something feeling? Justin Timberlake. Can't stop this feeling. Can't stop this feeling. I didn't have the record. I thought it was like a soft ass fucking pop record, and I was like, is this gonna fly? I was like, I don't have a lot of faith in this record, so I never downloaded it. And I went to my gig, and. I can't remember what the I remember kind of what was going on, but I don't know why these girls were around. Like, uh, it was like the Kentucky Derby was going on that day, mm-hmm. and I just remember like this girl came up and was like, "Can you play that record?" And I was like, "I don't have it." And she's like, "Well, can you download download it?" I was like, "There's no fucking Wi-Fi here." I was like, "I don't know how the fuck you expect me to download it." And then it's like, "Yo, can I plug into your aux?" I'm like, "This isn't a fucking car." Like, I don't know what to tell you, man. I was like, "I don't have the record. I can play Timberlake." Yeah. I don't have the record. I just thought it was a soft ass record, and I like that record. Well, here's the thing: it grew on me. I think that was the the first week it was out, and I was just like, mm, "I'm gonna give this some time and see what happens." Anna Kendrick's in the the original video of it because it's from the movie or whatever, mm-hmm. and I would pretty much pay money to watch Anna Kendrick read a phone book to me. So <laughs> I I honestly don't even know if I remember what the song sounded like the first week I heard it because all I saw was Anna Kendrick dancing around, and I have the biggest crush on her and actually i remember my story so finish yours um so like she kept harassing me and i was like look i was like leave me the fuck alone i'm like i've played like three justin timberlake songs i don't have it and it got to the point where they're harassing me and i was like i went up to the manager at the time and i was like yo dude i was like if you don't do something about this i'm like i'm gonna fucking do something about this and i go and you're not gonna like it and he goes yeah she was complaining about you i go why do you think that is i was like i just explained to you everything that's going on I'm like, please do something about it. He fucked off and went and hid in his office. And I was like, son of a bitch. So then her boyfriend came up to me and said something to me. And at that point, I cut the record and I was like, I'm going to pack my shit. And I go, if you're still standing here when I'm when I'm done packing my shit, I go, I'm going to beat the shit out of you. I go, I'm done putting up with your shit. I'm done putting up with your girlfriend's shit. I go, I'm fucking done. And that was the only time I've ever walked out of a gig. And thankfully, he was smart enough not to be there when I got done packing my shit up. (laughs) The only thing I had close, I mean, I've had some pretty, I mean, we've all had pretty terrible interactions with people. Um, The one, the closest I ever came to like unplugging and walking out actually had to do with a promoter. Which is funny because I very much so like this human being now. But when they were a promoter, I did not like them very much. Um, I was working on Milwaukee Street. And we were doing an 80s, 90s party. It mm-hmm. was like Saved by the Bell themed, right? All the the female bartenders were all dressed up basically like Kelly Kapowski's, like one piece bathing suit shit, like uh, super you teased have, you hair. Attention. Yeah, Continue. Like, yeah. So it was um, and 80s, 90s, like, okay, this is like right in my fucking wheelhouse. Sign me up, you know? So I'm DJing and it's, we started at 10 and this was like, kind of the the onslaught of the bobby bottle service free bottle shit right Mm -hmm. bring in four friends and get a free bottle of vodka (laughs) you know yeah that's kettle (laughs) um most bars don't do that anymore but that definitely ran rampant back then so um we i'm like up there playing whatever candy rain soul for real 90s monica brandy shit like that and it's literally like 1030. And the hustle on those bottles was always you had to be there by 10 or 1030 so that at least the place looked busy early, right? Yeah. That was the whole reason they wanted it. <laughs> so they end up doing um, the promoter's there, and he's got three, like, probably 19-year-old chicks with him that had good fakes. Like, these, I mean, they literally look like children. I'm like, there's no fucking prayer. You're 21, but whatever. You walked in with a promoter. He gets paid like 70 bucks and a handshake. So whatever. I don't really care. So he comes up to me, mind you, 80s, 90s party. And he's like, dude, I need you to play Stanky Leg. <laughs> and I just laugh because I'm like, A, I've never played Stanky Leg. B, I'm never going to play Stanky Leg. C, this is a fucking 80s, 90s night that you put together. <laughs> like this is a sports bar we have deer antler chandeliers (laughs) this isn't exactly a club dude like you could have had a burger here for lunch 
Like this isn't. They I mean, also had bomb meatloaf, by the way. Yeah, their burgers are fucking phenomenal too. Um, on the next podcast, we'll talk about me and Rufio making burgers at five in the morning in the kitchen down there one night. It was fucking yes. great. Um, but so he's like, dude, but like these chicks, they really want to hear Stinky Leg, or they're gonna leave. And I just started laughing. And he's like, what's so funny? I'm like, they're literally here drinking a free bottle. And you're worried about them leaving. How much money are we going to lose? Well, that's not the point. I'm like, I'm here to sell drinks. Like, they're drinking a free bottle that you got them. And they're threatening to leave. I don't fucking care. They're never going to spend a dollar anyway. They're drinking this fake fucking Mr. Boston's vodka being pawned off as fucking Grey Goose thinking that they're turning up posting their fucking pictures for top eight on MySpace or whatever the fuck it was back then. Like, no dude, I don't care. (laughs) He looks at me and he goes, I'm the promoter. You do what I tell you to. (sighs) So remember earlier when I said Germans are very understanding, I'm like, okay, now you just hit my hot button. Right. And at this point I'm like, you know, the Milwaukee street resident. I'm there for like two years at this point. I think I'm all hot shit. I'm all fucking feeling myself. I'm like, man, fuck this dude. So I get on the phone and I call the owner or one of the, you know, 407 owners at that time. Yeah. <laughs> I go, Hey, or text him. Say, Hey dude, um, we have a situation. He's like, what's wrong? I was like, well, your promoter eh, is, uh, really fucking pissing me off and not understanding that this is eighties, nineties night. And I'm not just going to sit here and bang out all the club hits that you're about to play at 720. That's why we're a sports bar across the street. Like, we don't do the club shit. We do the shit for everybody else. And then if you want club shit, you go to 720. That was the whole point. Oh, sorry, back then it was still apartment 720. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so the owner dude's like, okay, so what's the problem? Like, he literally just got in my face and said that he's my boss and was talking shit to me about, like, I need to do what he says. And he goes, okay. I was like, so here's what's going to happen. One of us is leaving. It can be me. It can be him. The only thing I'll say is that keep in mind, only one of us knows how to DJ. And I just let it go. Ten minutes later, the promoter came up. And he's like, yeah, I got to go. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, so-and-so texted me and told me to come over to 720. They want me over there instead. And I went, oh, okay. Well, have a good night. <laughs> so, like, that was the closest, like, flex I ever had to leaving. The funny thing is, years later, I, f- I won't say the guy's name, but, like, he's very successful at what he does, and I like him a whole hell of a lot more now. And he was just young doing his, you know, beginning mm-hmm. promoter thing, standard promoter. Like, actually, it's funny how many promoters that, like, I didn't get along with originally. Like, newbie. Best example, Newbie started as a promoter. He was a Marquette kid, so I didn't get along with Newbie. We always fucking bumped heads. Mm-hmm. And then now I fucking adore Newbie. I we text each other old dude fucking music to listen to and talk about bourbon and shit. And like it's just funny, like I said, because this dude totally tried to flex on me, like, you're gonna do what I tell you to. I'm like, you can fuck right the hell off. Like, Newbie's Newbie's one of my favorite people too. I actually uh I forgot where I ran into him one night. I want to say it was distill. And it was right when his his now i think wife mm-hmm. alicia yeah um her father was in town that dude's a fucking riot and like he like somehow we were talking oh, he's a big man you guy exactly <laughs> so he, like he like he literally picks up my sleeve and like pulls on my shirt and he's like is that a manchester united tattoo i was like you're goddamn right i was like who do you support he's like unite he starts singing a united song to me and i was like <gasps> i'm like did we just become best friends and noob's like Dude, that's my future father-in-law, or like my girlfriend's, yeah. like uh, my that, girlfriend's dad. That dude is a walking fucking hurricane. Dude, that he guy is, was top five of my favorite people I've ever hung he, out with. He is an absolute riot. I, I felt bad that the man had at least fifteen to twenty years on me and had seven times the amount of energy I had at like fucking <laughs> one in the morning. Like, <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what the fuck they put in the water over there. I mean, I know it rots all your guys' fucking teeth out, but Jesus Christ, like this dude was. I mean, he was larger than fucking life. I don't even know what his name is, but in my head it's Nigel, and it very well may be Nigel. It's it's a strong possibility. I uh, I just got a text uh, from Da Padusa, uh, uh, my brother Randon, who says we got to wrap soon. I'm assuming he has to start doing the news again relatively well, soon. Well, I suppose we should probably pick this up another time then. Um, you know what? This has been great. I, yeah, I think we do have to save some stuff. Uh, I never even got it. I never even got a chance to talk about Shock G. I want to talk about San Francisco fucking hip hop and so on and so forth. Too short and we since you bounced me, I was supposed to be here last week originally, and I got rescheduled because I'm not that cool. No, it was. 
I explained. Steven Hurst. You. I'm just happy yeah. that I was. I hope at least I was your first guest to get booted. Um, so yeah, we'll we, we'll we'll do it again when you're you know run out of people that you want to have on. And you're like, uh, I need someone to fill. Then you know. You know what? I haven't gotten to that point. Like I'm having I'm having Lee and Cassidy on next week, and it's just because I just love hanging out and talking shit with those two guys. <laughs> Dude, just talk politics the whole time, please. <laughs> just let the two of them Furbies just fucking go at it. It'd be the greatest shit ever. <laughs> just start saying random shit on both sides. Just be like, all Republicans are idiots. And then wait, and then go, all Democrats are... Free. Like, just watch them both just fucking go. Like, it's, it's always funny, like, especially now that I've watched that doc on, like, QAnon and shit like that. Dude, it's so good. Um, oh, my God. Like, it, it's one of those where, like, Lee was constantly quoting it, and I was like, bro, I'm like, where the fuck... Like, I, I'm like... I know I've seen some shit on Reddit, but I'm like, where the fuck are you pulling this shit Dude, from? It's so wild. And for the record, I love, obviously, I love yeah. me. I love Cass. Cass scares the shit out of me. First time I met the dude, he fucking shook my hand and showed me his 380. And I'm like, that's a hell of a way to say hello. <laughs> but I get it. Yeah. <laughs> like, you win. Like, you served. I ain't fucking with you. Like, <laughs> good dude. But uh, yeah, like, two very strong personalities, one might say, uh, yeah. that you're going to have next week. So, <laughs> But I mean, between the two of us, like, if it turns into story time, like, it's oh, the, the shit that we've done. Like, I remember there was a, we talked about it recently, where we went up to Wausau. We had a friend that was performing at um, one of the strip clubs up there. And, like, she was a, like, I don't even know how to explain this. If you weren't around me at the time, like that just sounds like bad. But it's one of those that like porn stars, features, models that worked at Silk used to fly in and hang out with us just to go drinking. And it was one of those that like they would fly in early. So like on a Wednesday night, you'd be hanging out at Soho and you'd like look over and be like, is that so and so? And they're like, yeah, they just come into town to drink with like Lee Parker and Cass. And it was just insane. Like those stories are nuts. Like, yeah, I, I, the only one I ever met out of that whole crew was Aaliyah, and I went drinking with her one night, and I, oh, I thought I was gonna fucking die. That woman's a monster. <laughs> like, funny as hell too, but uh, yeah, like hanging out with her boozing was like one of the scariest things I've ever fucking experienced. One of my favorite Aaliyah stories was on my birthday, and we'll wrap it up after this. One of my favorite Aaliyah stories was um. We went out on my birthday, and I think I took like thirty people to go see Velvet Revolver, and we ended up, we ended up at Chico's where that, uh, where that fire had happened, uh, at Pizza Man, or I think that was actually that Mexican restaurant. And, oh, I remember that place. Yeah. Yeah. So we're there, we're hanging out, and we are drunk as shit. It's two in the morning. We're eating tacos, and she threw like a chip at me, and I threw one back, and she like threw a handful of chips. Well, I took the whole basket, dumped it on her. And then she tried to one up me and I finally just grabbed the whole table of food and dumped it in her direction. And like, we're laughing like a couple of hobos that just found a 20. Like we think this is the funniest shit in the world. And obviously with my uh, drinking and anger problems, someone just goes, us real fucking mature. And the fight popped off from there. Um, Watching Aaliyah take a grown man, put her under his head and beat the shit out of him was probably one of my favorite fucking things to see in my entire life. Like that will live rent free in my head for the rest of my fucking life. Like this six foot Amazon just whoop and just giving him the fucking business. Straight happy Gilmore. Straight happy Gilmore. She's she's awesome. I fucking love Leah. Yeah. Um I missed the fact that our relationship just fucking took a downward spiral uh later, but nah man. In in the time at the time it was just fucking hilarious. It was great times. Good um, people. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. No, thank you for coming on. Sorry about last week. Like I said, the... It's totally fine, dude. I'm just fucking with you. Yeah. It turns out I'm an unemployed DJ. I got nothing but fucking time, so... Well, great. You can do this again in like two months with me. You, you tell me when. I'll, I'll be more than happy to. Hopefully, Listen, hopefully, I still have a hope of a career after all the shit talking I just did, so... Shit. You and I both, man. <laughs> well, well, you listen... Got a, you got a podcast, so... Uh, you know what? All I have is like a fucking box to stand on for fucking five people or five of my friends to listen to. <laughs> um, once again, everyone, thank you for, for tuning in. Uh, big thank you to DJ E. Rich for, for joining. Uh, join us next week. Uh, Lee and Cassidy will be joining me again. We'll probably talk some MMA shit. We'll tell some old stories. Maybe I'll dump a little gas on a fire and let those two talk politics for a while. Until next week, thank you for tuning in. Mahalo. <laughs>